Uh, let's call this meeting to order at 7 1 p.m. Please rise for the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. Thank you. <laughs> Sunshine Law Notice. In accordance with the provisions of the Open Public Meetings Act, public meetings may be held in person or by means of communication equipment to include streaming services and other online meeting platforms. This meeting is being held in person and through the Zoom meeting platform being broadcast from Borough Hall, 748 River Road, Fairhaven, New Jersey. Public participation for this regular council meeting of May 13th, 2024 is available by calling phone number or through web conference Zoom. Members of the public will be on mute until it is time for questions or comments, which will be announced. At that time, the public has the opportunity to question or comment by phone or through Zoom by the raise hand button and will be called on at the appropriate time. Notice that this meeting was included in scheduled meetings, which was adopted by resolution number 2024-13 and sent to the Asbury Park Press and the Two River Times on February 4th, 2024, posted on the borough website, the Bolton Board and Municipal Building, and has remained continuously posted as required under the statute. With adequate notice having been given, the borough clerk is directed to include the statements, the statement in the minutes of this meeting. Allison, may I please have a roll call? Roll, yes. Dimaselli, yes. Howie, yes. Huh? Yes. Robert <laughs> Yes. Olson. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, starting off, we have two proclamations. One is for National Police Week. Chief here. Yes, sir. And we're going to follow that out with uh, National Public Works as well. Chief, you can join me up front. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have a proclamation here. It reads, this is for National Police Week, May 12th to 18th, 2024. It reads, whereas National Police Week in America was created to honor and recognize the sacrifice and contribution made by police officers and communities, both large and small. And whereas the 15th day of May is known as Peace Officers Memorial Day, and the week in which May 15th falls as National Police Week. And whereas every day, Public safety officers work tireless, tirelessly to protect our citizens, enforce our laws, and keep our neighborhoods safe. They report for duty, knowing full well the dangers they face and the sacrifices they may be called upon to make. During the week of May 12th to 18th, 2024, we pay tribute to the thousands of men and women who serve us with extraordinary, extraordinary bravery, and we remember the heroes who have laid down their lives in pursuit of a safer, more just society. And whereas the members of the borough of Fairhaven Police Department play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the citizens of the borough of Fairhaven, and whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the duties, responsibilities, hazards, and sacrifices of their police department, and that members of our police department recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, and by protecting the innocent against deception, and the weak against oppression or intimidation. Now, therefore, I, Josh Halpern, Mayor of the Borough of Fairhaven, Fairhaven, do hereby proclaim the week of May 12th to 18th, 2024, as Police Week in the Borough of Fairhaven, and recognize the police officers of our community and country whose devotion to duty brings safety to all that they serve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, follow that up. Following week, we have proclamation for National Public Works Week, May 19th to 25th, connecting the world through public work. Whereas public works infrastructure, facilities, and services are of a vital importance to a sustainable community and to the health, safety, and well being of the people of Fairhaven. And whereas the support of an understanding and well informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs such as streets and highways, public buildings, street lights, leak and drug collection, parks, storm drain systems, and maintenance of all public spaces. And whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, 
as well as their planning, design, and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials. And whereas the year 2024 marks the 64th annual National Public Works Week, sponsored by the American Public Works Association uh, with a theme of connecting the world through public works. Now, therefore, I, Josh Halpern, Mayor of the Borough of Fairhaven, New Jersey, on behalf of the governing body, encourage all Fairhaven residents to recognize and extend their appreciation for the hard work and dedication of our public works department, which contributes to the health, safety, comfort, and quality of life in the Borough of Fairhaven. Thank you. Okay, um, before we move forward here with the uh, NJDP year management plan, I just wanted to take a quick moment um, to formally con congratulate our new CFO. And I don't know if she's here. Is Nancy here? Well, uh, Nancy's been here for a few years now, and she's really uh, doing a great job for the Borough of Fairhaven, and we wish you all the success in the future. And uh, can't, to be, can't wait to be along for the ride with you. Thank, Thank you, Nancy. Nancy. Um, all right, next up, we have a uh, NJDP is here for a Deer Management Plan presentation. Brian and Megan, do I have that correct? Well, no. <clears throat> um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, here. Do you mind swinging in front here, just because uh, folks that are virtual won't be able to hear you because the owl. Okay, yeah. sure. Uh, I just want to be able to see my lap. Well, actually, I guess I don't need to. So you can see that. Well, you could put it on the table. It's all. Right. Be nice. Now that I can see it, it's okay. <laughs> So where did I start? Just right, right in the middle, if right. I can see the All right, I'll do the three sixty. So we'll have all the this. Um, yeah, just want to hit. Um, you know, that under uh, slideshow again, and then from beginning in the top left. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I can swap the displays again. One more. There you go. Okay. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Uh, so I'm Brian Chung. Um, I'm a deer biologist at New Jersey Fish and Wildlife and the DEP. Um, Megan Mills is here. Believe it or not, she is a northern region bi deer biologist, and that's where you belong. If you were a little bit south, you'd still be with Megan, our southern region deer biologist. So um, we're going to talk about today, we're going to try to get um, a collective understanding for why we make the recommendations that we do. So a lot of times the public doesn't really understand why we say the things that we say um, and why we you know, make the recommendations that we do to the, to the local communities. Um, a lot of people think it just doesn't seem to make sense. Let's see if that works. That might not be. So I'll just have to say next, we'll forget about that. Okay, good. Well, I'll just try this one. Um, so yeah, so what informs your management decisions? And uh, next, there's going to be a lot of, oh, that actually did work. Was that you or was that me? You. Oh, sweet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, so what informs your management decisions? So primarily, um, first and foremost, we're thinking about human health. That you all are there? No, we're not there. Next, please. Okay, so oh, a little too far. I'd be a little delayed on this. I'll just say next and we'll avoid some uh -huh. of the uh, you, yeah, I think it just because I have a presentation, so she's okay with me hitting. Uh it might it might be okay. So if you could hit back for me twice. Uh if you could hit the left arrow key about three times. Oh, it's still going. <laughs> Two more times, please. Sorry. Okay, we're here. So human health. 
So the biggest one we're thinking about usually is your vehicle pollutants. So that was a picture taken in New Jersey. Um, I believe for that one, it did kill the driver. So we're obviously thinking about people and their health. Tick-borne diseases, uh, unfortunately, New Jersey does have a lot of them. Um, you know, I have many colleagues in, in my field who are a pretty high risk group. So my friend can't eat red meat. I have other friends who've had Bell's palsy because of uh, Lyme's disease. Um, and then there's other deer related diseases. So you can see next. Um, following human health, we're thinking about ecosystem health. So for ecosystem health, we're thinking about um, how much, generally we're thinking about how much deer are browsing on the plants. So um, if you think about uh, your forest, uh, there's, you know, there's young trees growing up and before the trees get tall enough to be above the height of a deer at its standing height or even on its hind legs when they're desperate or really like that plant, um, it creates that little browse line that you see there. So, um, so before those trees can get big, um, they're very susceptible to deer browsing. And if they browse too much, it can actually alter the composition of your forest. So if you think about a forest um, growing with time, if deer are selectively choosing some species and not other species, it actually can change the outcome of what your forest looks like. Um, so that can lead to a loss of biodiversity, a spread of invasive species, which deer tend to not prefer. You can head next. Um, and then of course, public feedback. So um, in some parts of the state, we do think about them for the desire for the resource and the people like seeing them. Um, they are you know, a beautiful animal. Um, and so there is like, you know, some economics behind wanting them. But today we're obviously thinking about uh, the economic impacts. Um, a lot of times this can mean like backyard gardens. Uh, some of you may be experiencing that now. Uh, in other parts of the state, we're thinking a lot about agriculture. In that example, you can see where deer were excluded from that soybean field, just the amount of damage uh, that occurred all around it. So um, examples like that uh, can be very palpable. You can hit next. I'm going to try to concise. You can hit next to just saying next. I think it's but... the one. <laughs> so that, that leads me um, to kind of introducing this idea. So a lot of times people um, are thinking that, uh, you know, fish and wildlife, you know, we're looking to maximize the number of deer. We are deer biologists, so we want the most deer possible. Um, that would kind of be the ecological caring. You can get next. That would kind of be the ecological caring capacity. The social carrying capacity is the number of deer that we can tolerate as humans. You know, there's only so many that we can really tolerate. You can hit next twice. All right, one more time. The ecological carrying capacity is literally the number of deer that a, a habitat can support. So um, the ecological carrying capacity or the number of deer that a forest or a township can support is always going to be higher than the social carrying capacity. Um, and we can even think about that for the health of the deer as well. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Next. So in thinking about, you know, this upper bound, of uh, the number of deer on the landscape, um, it starts to, you can hit next, it starts to raise the question of um, what are the factors that limit the deer population size? We talked about some being just the number of, uh, you know, the, the food resources that they're competing for. Um, getting into some of like the basic biology of the deer, um, we can hit next. We can start to categorize um, some of the things that influence deer growth or decline rates. Um, one big category is birthing and development rates. So fecundity, that's like the number of fawns an individual mom can have. Um, the gestation period, that is you can hit next, the gestation period is um, the time that it takes for them to have that fawn, um, the sexual maturation. So how long does it take for a, a fawn of the first year, of its first year, to be able to reproduce? Um, so of those things, if we're thinking now like about managing deer, none of those really seem like great options to mess with too much. Um, whereas fecundity, though, we're all familiar with birth control. Uh, that is a thing with wildlife. Um, so we're going to we're going to scratch the other ones and we're going to talk about fecundity in a bit, birth control in a little bit. And then next. So right now, um, we're talking about all the options so that everyone leaves the room knowing what the options are and why we're focusing on the ones that we are. 
Uh, you can hit next again. So survival rate, if we, you know, we can influence birthing rates in some fashion, we can influence death rates in other fashions. So you can hit next again. So we can break that up into natural deaths or human caused death. Uh, you can hit next again. Of natural deaths, there is senescence or just them aging out, you know, at a certain point, we all go. Um, disease, um, so, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the wild spread of diseases, uh, we are not going to talk about introducing diseases intentionally. Uh, you can hit next. And then predation rates, you can hit next. And so of those three predation rates, um, that's something that's a hot topic in wildlife. Um, we're not really going to try to make them die naturally earlier. We're not going to spread seeds. So we're going to talk about predation a little bit. You can hit next. So human cause, you can hit next again. Deoreal collisions, obviously we're not looking to increase deoreal collisions <laughs> to reduce the deer population. Though, that is among the most common ways that we ma manage our deer very passively, but that is the way that we currently manage the deer. Uh, and then, of course, lethal removal, intentionally killing them in some way or another. Hit next. We got more of these. Hit next again. Mm -hmm. These can lag a little bit. Yeah, that's probably true. You can hit next. Probably hit next like three times. That's probably true. <laughs> so, um, so emigration. So thinking about deer just leaving or coming in. So emigration deer leaving the township. Um, so there's natural dispersal, and then of course we can track and relocate them. We can hit next. Uh, we can't really influence natural dispersal. Um, the mechanisms that would drive that are a little unethical. So we're, but we will talk about trapping and relocating as a potential option. It seems plausible. We can hit next again. Okay, so here's our kind of four options from the last what we all went through. So, um, and I'll actually toss in. In northern states, uh, one of the death rates, the na natural death rates, are die-offs in the winter. So just winter mortality, um, you know, too cold, lack of food, too much snowpack, they can't access food. Um, you can hit next. Of these, we're going to kind of move through um, kind of our, our least favorable options, um, the things that we are not recommending. We're going to wind up towards what we are recommending. So um, of the pros, for animal predators, you do have less human intervention, so that can seem very appealing for people. If we were to, you know, let's say, release mountain lions into the area, increase wildlife diversity, there are more mountain lions. Uh, cost efficient once instituted. So you can hit next. Um, so these are fairly obvious for this municipality. Um, it will complicate wildlife conflicts. Now, so when I when we're talking uh, predators, I'm sort of joking about mountain lions. That's obviously not feasible. But things like coyotes, uh, we do have uh, a very robust population of coyotes in the state already, and they do kill quite a few fawns every year. Um, they kill adult deer occasionally as well. So we do have some of this going on. Um, the other big ones are bobcat, uh, black bear. Both of those will kill um, both like sick deer, um, but will definitely kill fawns in the spring. Um, and, uh, but uh, in terms of introducing them, the options that we have of what we used to have in New Jersey are wolves and mountain lions. So it's hard, we're not really talking about it. Um, so with animal predators, you have a reduced control, obviously. You know, you're trying to elicit this uh, little wildlife worker for you. Um, there's a good chance it is not going to stay in your municipality. I'll say that, you know, certainly not in this one. Uh, they want to go where they can have big home ranges. They have complex habitat requirements. So, you know, when we're thinking wolves or mountain lions, we're thinking potentially hundreds of miles that they're going to be rolling uh, for them to be healthy and happy. Um, it's costly up front. And um, on top of that, you know, you have to acquire those animals. And then on top of that, uh, these large predators are uh, very susceptible to deer vehicle collisions. So, uh, you can go ahead and get next. Uh, we, a few years ago, we had a mountain lion come from North Dakota, made it to Connecticut before it modified it. You can hit next again. So we're getting closer here. Um, trapping and relocating, uh, trap and transfer. So um, so this does have a, a lot of support um, you know, for people that don't want to harm the animals. Um, so that's a plus for this. 
and you have a high level control. And when I say control, I mean you can throw a lot of money at it and you can get results by doing that. So you can hit next. So um, you need a destination, and that's actually increasingly problematic. Um, I'm not going to go into the weeds with it, but there is a, a pretty devastating disease called chronic wasting disease that is pretty much banned to move cervids or the species of deer uh, around the country. You can't cross state lines without a special permit to do so. Um, unintended mortalities. So um, unfortunately, uh, sort of a common theme we're going to be discussing is um, in some of these efforts to avoid harming deer, there still ends up being a lot of harm in deer. It's just accidental and it's not always very pretty. Um, so uh, in some studies, most studies that you read, uh, trapping and transferring deer, um, it, you know, it's a very stressful event. Um, you can look up capture myopathy. Um, that's what occurs to deer and they can die just from the stress of it up to 30 days later. Uh, tends to be somewhere around five to 10% uh, mortality from capture and food. Disease transmission that we just talked about, race disease, and obviously it's head next, and you can head next again. So birth control, we're definitely getting closer. So birth control is like a hot topic in wildlife conservation. It's worth discussing. So um, it has high animal rights to support. Again, you're not actively uh, killing deer or removing deer. Um, and you have high control. Again, you can cost a lot of money at it, and you will see um, results from that. Um, you can go to the cons. So, sort of along the other lines, it requires capture, so that also you know, that's a lot of effort. Um, but also, anytime you're capturing the deer, like I mentioned, that capture myopathy, that becomes a big issue. Um, so, uh, in the studies where they've done this, they do document an, a, a, a significant, you know, we'll, we'll say like five to 10% of the deer um, that they captured and released um, died from capture myopathy. Um, really, deer are really not good um, in captivity, um, wild deer. Um, it does require long, long time scales. So for um, the kind of consensus and what the data has shown from efforts to do various forms of birth control, and we'll get into some of the different types, um, you're talking like 10 years before you see some results, um, and it's usually pretty minimal. Um, for uh, and at that like 10 year mark, you're kind of expecting to still have about 60 to 80 percent of what you originally had. So um, it's and, you know, we're talking on a scale of this community. I'd say we're pretty safely talking, you know, very easily tens of thousands of dollars. I would I wouldn't be surprised if it if it crossed that hundreds of thousands mark. Obviously, it's a very different scenario, but just to toss out a number. Um, for that you can look into this project and Staten Island, they're up to like $7 million trying to do this. So um, that's a bigger area. We're talking about a small area. So it's not apples to apples by any means. Um, I would encourage you guys to look up uh, the effort in Cincinnati, um, Ohio. They have a um, non-lethal birth control program. Uh, and they get very honest feedback um, about some of the things they've struggled with. Um, and they have a pretty unique situation. Um, so again, birth control, um, it's important to consider that, uh, yes, you are reducing the number of birth in, births, but they still have to die. And typically what happens is that, um, deer vehicle collisions increase, um, in Staten Island, um, looks like up to a hundred, uh, you know, two, up to a hundred percent increase, uh, in deer vehicle collisions in the couple years following um their the beginning of their program so that contributed to um mate searching activities so if you can imagine you are a buck looking for a willing um mate and none of the mates are willing because they're sterilizing by some means or another um those bucks are going to continue to look for a mate uh, in some cases the the, the females uh, the does will not know and you know that they can't successfully mate and they might still have those drivers and that can extend that breeding season longer and longer because they continue that mate searching. So um, in the places that I've instituted this with a lot of roads, um, typically the deer vehicle collisions increase dramatically. And so any short-term uh, change in population 
largely can be attributed to those deaths, not the birth control, but the deaths. So are they primarily male deaths? Uh, they're both. Um, some of that is with the dose, largely with, with males. Yeah, largely with males. Um, but it is it is a bit of both. Yeah, because uh, the, depending on the type of sterilization that's done, uh, the dose can still have pretty high rates of mate searching activity. You know, they never get bred, so they never get that, um, you know, uh, 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 hormone fulfillment that they've completed that task. Um, um, so it is inefficient, you know, it, comparatively to lower arousal talk about, which is lethal management, um, and it's quite costly, as I've covered. So you, you're, you should uh, be considering uh, in the ballpark of um, $1,000 to $3,000 per year that you're going to sterilize um, versus we'll get into the lethal management. It's, it's much lower. Now, uh, Ohio, in Cincinnati, Ohio, they, they have found um, options where they had volunteers, volunteer veterinarians that made themselves available. They still had to spend a lot of money up front to get it going. Um, but it looks like they're going to be able to keep the project going um, with more volunteer efforts. So I don't want to say that it's all <clears throat> doom and gloom, but it's very important that you fully consider um, all the implications of going this route. Um, Lethal management. That's, um, you know, full disclosure. That's our recommendation. So you can hit next. Um, you can hit next again. I'm usually the one hitting next, so I follow them. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> um, so uh, generally it has public support. Um, the public wants to see action taken. Um, obviously, there is always going to be, a, you know, a portion of the public that does not support it. You know, it, it's... It, it's home at a lot of uh, ethics and values, um, but uh, generally uh, the public supports it. Um, it's far more efficient than the other options. You have a high level of control. Again, you can add effort and you can get results and those results are immediate. Um, it can provide local food. Um, so an important principle that uh, we definitely think is important is that um, it's called wants and waste. Um, so it, it kind of started with Teddy Roosevelt back in the day. Um, where this idea that uh, animals being killed for their hides alone and the meat being left, um, it you know finally started to bother people, um, and that's considered a waste. So actually, um, with certain permits that we issue, it is mandatory that the that the meat from the deer get donated to uh, the hungry to avoid that. <clears throat> um, and it's inexpensive. Uh, if you're incorporating volunteers, a lot of volunteers pay to do that service. Um, and so that can help with some of the administrative costs up front if you're developing a specific plan um, and trying to have a high level of regulation, which I would recommend for your municipality. You can hit next. Um, so uh, the cons, it does require um, thought, you know, it requires land management buy-in. So, you know, the, the superintendents of your park or however, uh, your parks are managed. Um, they do need to have a little bit of buy-in. The police department needs to know what's going on, and who's doing what and where. Um, potentially, a couple parks might need to be closed for a week or two um, if you want to have a high uh, removal rate for those couple weeks. Um, and obviously, so uh, this one, of course, potentially is why we have some of the people in the room. It, it um, you know, people, uh, some people are just simply ethically opposed to it. So that that's always the case. Um, and uh, it, it's a completely valid uh, opinion to have about it. You know, it is the, the killing of an animal. So it's a sensitive subject. So you can end next. So I'm gonna take a break from talking about lethal management. And I'm just gonna talk about some of the other non-lethal options that we didn't already cover. Things that don't get at the reproductive biology of the animal. Um, it's we're just talking about things like fencing. So um, you can hit next like probably nine times. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm not going to really go into this list. I just I, I tend to call. So the um, that is the title of a paper that I'm pulling this from. So a, a DOT partnered with a, a local uh, Department of Natural Resources to do a study on what works and what doesn't <laughs> along our roadways. Uh, if your vehicle collisions is the primary issue, you can hit next and probably like four more times. Um, that's one more time and you'll probably get it. Um, thank you. Um, 
So we'll just talk about fencing. So uh, fencing along the roadways it was found to be the most promising solution. Uh, it, that doesn't really make sense in this municipality. When we're thinking about fencing, this was a study done um, out west, or this was a, a review, a literature review that was conducted for Western states. And really, we're talking about uh, migrating elk, migrating mule deer, um, that you're diverting the migration path um, to an underpass um, by fencing off that highway. So it's a little different here. We're not going to fence every single property. Um, and fencing, you need to be very careful with fencing. Uh, Bergen County uh, has a lot of issues with uh Deer getting hung up on fences, uh, which is probably the worst option for uh, deer management. So um, you can hit next, I forget if this is okay. So, this question. Sure. Did do any of these impact the migration patterns? Okay, so good question. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, we talked a little bit about immigration and uh, immigration and emigration. So deer in New Jersey, really, you can ignore the, the concept of migration. That's really, uh, we're talking like northern deer, um, where there's big altitude changes. Um, um, so like deer up in the mountains might come down to like suburban neighborhoods. Um, for you guys, I would think that um, in, the, in the summer and fall, deer will find a lot of forage on more natural things. Um, and then you might expect increased in the spring and winter, a really increased um, presence of them in like backyard gardens and things like that, where we're, um, you know, they eat it, we plant it the next day, things like that. So, um, but in terms of any like large scale migration, uh, deer in this area, I would expect to have a home range of, uh, you know, no bigger than a quarter mile. You know, so the deer that are here are your deer for the most part. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes total sense. sense. So yeah, circling back, um, circling back to this. So um, if you consider that there is no deer management occurring ground, and your neighbors are not managing the deer, and the neighbors behind that are not managing the deer, you have some coyotes wandering through, no bobcats, no bears. So the only thing that is removing deer on a daily basis um, in any significant way are cars. And so if you reduce your deer vehicle collisions at a significant scale, and that's all you did, then you will have more deer. And so, you know, the, um, you know, the rates might be a little different deer per car, um, but you're probably still gonna see a lot of deer vehicle collisions. Certainly a lot of the other issues that you see would probably go up because you'd have more deer. And that just kind of makes sense. You can hit next. Um, we'll talk about some caveats to that. Um, but it's definitely something to be aware of. Some, you know, like I said, a lot of these have the theme of, you know, these good gestures towards the deer. What we, you know, as humans think, like we project on what the deer would want. Um, it's not really best for the deer a lot of times. So yeah, you can hit next a lot. Um, just get that box pretty full. Um, so again, I'm not going to talk about each of these individually, um, but. Uh, uh, so some other options, um, particularly we're talking about like preserves and, and things like that, um, is sticking a big old fence around that preserve um, and trying to keep the deer out. So just protect those plants in the preserve. You can hit back a couple times. Um, and so again, if you think about it, the number of deer in an area we define, we would call it the density of the deer in the area. So if you fence out a large proportion of your municipality, the number of deer remains the same. The area they have access to is less. And so you have an increased density of deer in the areas that are left. So again, it's just not helping out your, your backyards. It's not a holistic approach to deer management. Um, you're kind of thinking about one specific locality. You're not really thinking about your neighbor. Um, and then repellents just, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have experimented with repellents in your gardens. And if they are hungry, they will eat. Um, so you can head next. Um, certainly some of these technologies, you know, with, with, with time, maybe some repellents would get better. Um, and maybe some of you have some that work for you, um, but it is not a population level uh, tool. So uh, circling back um, to <clears throat> lethal management, we've kind of covered all the other options. Um, why don't you just hit next like four times? So actually get the third box up and we'll just look at it all. So, um, 
these are these bars on the bottom. They're a visual. They're not from a study. I just made them. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's not not real data on the bottom. Um, so unmanaged hunting. We're um, we're really think of like um, you know as fish and wildlife. We have wildlife management areas where um, hunters can go anytime. They don't need to call somebody. They just go and they can hunt there and they can you know legally manage the deer there. Likewise, our state parks, um, a lot of land uh, that is more suitable to that type of hunt. Again, nobody knows who's, who's there at all times. We have regulations, um, but you don't have to check. So that's unmanaged hunting. We'll just kind of move along. That's not really what's going to happen. So managed hunting. Um, so that would be where, in, in, this, in this column that I've made, um, I, it would likely be volunteers. Sometimes they pay to apply for that um, permit to do that, um, and it would have a lot of oversight. So those volunteer hunters would come along with our um, state safety certification. They have to take an online course and then go uh, display proficiency um, with their weapon. Um, and um, so they're vetted and monitored. Um, we would help you with uh, fish and wildlife background checks. Um, and uh, basically, you just want to know who and where, when is the idea. Um, and those people would likely have additional regulations that we don't impose on these big state forests, but you guys would probably like to impose on your local parks where, you know, there's the, the public spaces where this might happen. You know, examples of that might be, we'll talk about it a bit, but examples of that might be, you know, they can only go on a certain day of the week. Um, or maybe you close the park for a week, um, 75 feet from a trail. Uh, they have to be elevated, so they're shooting downwards. Um, archery only is probably what we're talking about. So there's a lot of things. It can be lengthy. Um, it's probably a follow-up conversation on fine-tuning the program for you guys. And then there's contracted hunting. So just separating it out. Um, you can have contractors without a special permit for us. They just have to do what um, our regular hunting um, regulations say, but um, a lot of places in the state choose to get a special permit with us called a community-based deer management permit that allows for special um, exemptions to regulations um, and special methods of take, we would call it. Um, so maybe different weapons, maybe you track the deer and euthanize them. Um, uh, so you know, different different tools, um, but that's an option. And so again, you know, with these, we kind of start with low um, low efficacy, um, and then as we manage it more and more, and we you know uh, toss maybe more money at it, um, it gets more and more effective. But you know, obviously the, the cost goes up. Um, so we you know this is probably getting into the depths and the weeds of this is probably another conversation. But you can hit next probably three two one. Oh, no, that's good. Yeah, hit next up four times. Okay, so um, we talked about it a little bit. Um, so the state has a lot of regulations on our deer hunters. Um, we are not Colorado, we're not New York, we don't pretend to be. Um, so our hunters um, are, you know, they, they have to know a lot more than in, in other states. Um, so we have, uh, we already have state mandated uh, safety zones where any potentially occupied dwelling, whether it's occupied or not, if it's potentially occupied, they cannot shoot a bow within 150 feet. They cannot shoot a firearm within 450 feet. And that includes the projectile heading that direction. Um, and some special things for school playgrounds and, and such. Again, we're probably not really talking about those areas. How far does an arrow travel? Depends how um, it depends on the weight of the bow and how high you, you point it. But you can think, you know, uh, if you're being extremely negligent and it's a high powered bow, let's say it's like three, four hundred yards. Um, if you're shooting from a tree stand and the deer is below you, um, um, then you can expect that it would go 20 yards. So um, that's, you know, of course, anytime you're talking about any of these things, you, you know, there, there is, you have to kind of trust humans a little bit with these tools. Um, so whether you go with contractors or you go with uh, volunteer hunters that pass our safety exams, um, you know, certainly there's a little trust. We all get in our cars every day and, you know, sort of trust each other <laughs> when, when that's happening. So 
Um, so there, there is, you know, there's of course always a human element. Um, I can say this that in New Jersey we have never had a non-hunter harmed by a hunter. This has never happened. Um, occasionally, unfortunately, people hurt their friends while they're out with each other um, with accidents. Um, so you know that has happened in New Jersey. It's not super common, but it happens. Um, but in terms of a, a hunter harming a non-hunter, it, it hasn't happened. There's also a ton of like safety stuff that if this is the route that you guys choose to go, you can build your own program. So like what Brian was saying about like being elevated, like most of our county programs require their hunters to be in a stand a minimum number of feet above because a hunter is not going to take a shot that they know is not going to be lethal. So, and then that changes, like I was saying, the trajectory down. Mm -hmm. So that's why I would say, like, if you wanted to, you can make the 75 foot thing from footpaths because if, if the hunter is being responsible and if they've been vetted through our program and then we re background check them before they're part of your program, they're not going to be taking that shot where they're going to be shooting over a pathway. Mm -hmm. And they also know that they're not going to be shooting short pathway. They're going to set up either back to the path because they're shooting away. Yeah. And most most programs that we work with now and develop, they're all low because it's just safe, safer, it's quieter, there's less like destruction with it. And just it's just that's where most people are going these days. But it's hunting is safer than most compact sports. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's actually kind of odd, but yeah, it, it is. Um and, and a lot of that has to do with the, like the culture around it. Um, you know, just you know, you know, hunters should hold other hunters accountable. So there's a lot of that going on. But then on top of that, you know, of course, um, it's high penalties if people make mistakes. Quick um, follow-up follow question. Yeah. When, um, if I was a hunter and I got certified in bow mm -hmm. and I'm a hunter certified bow that participates in one of these programs, are the requirements the same? Or if I'm going to participate in a lethal management program, the requirements are slightly more as far as hunter. So so that's another so like <laughs> it's going to be the same or more stringent okay. it's never going to be less stringent than our okay. every hunter is required to go through hunter ed um and like brian said it's one of those things where if you make a mistake or you like mess up in some form the penalties are, are heavy um you can lose your license you can have your firearms confiscated like there's there's stuff that goes along with it that's another part that, like, if you guys decide to go forward with this, that you can require more, um, more testing. So a couple of our, like, uh, Mercer County is a great example. They have a proficiency exam. Mm -hmm. So like Mercer County, um, they put their new. There's a, an extra profic proficiency exam that goes along with Hunter Ed. So you have to come to their program executives, prove to them that you can shoot accurately, and then you're put on their probationary property for a year or two. And if you're being successful and achieving the management goals, then you can get moved to the more higher profile property, but only after you go through that vetting process. So it's very, and you guys are in zone 50. So this is gonna be, it's like one of our most liberal zones. So you, this is gonna be very much like build your own program. You guys can basically do whatever you want. You can limit how many people you're gonna put permit out for. Like it, it's gonna be very much Whatever you guys are comfortable with, and we will help build it. So what Brian's talking about tonight is very, very broad. If this is the path that you guys decide to go down, we are going to hold your hand the entire way through, and we can talk about all of the mining details that go into it. But yeah, it's you're always going to, at a minimum, have our safety, where they have to take an online test, and then they have to do the field course. Okay. So there's always that minimum for that. Yeah, but it would come from you. So we would help you with, with developing those um, and find out the things that you're uncomfortable with. And and maybe you go as far as uh, you go to the site and with the, you know, with, uh, the police, you have them demonstrate that they can safely climb the tree and safely shoot at a target um, in that designated location. So you can take it as far as you want. Um, and so it's, it's going to be kind of hard to see on the screen, um, but I kind of like showed uh, the safety zones. I'll make it a different color in the future, but it's like that kind of black hash mark around the houses. Um, so we can help you develop these maps where we, um, where the hunters will be able to see on the map the areas where they can legally be. And then uh, potentially 
uh, law enforcement, because you don't have a lot of open space, law enforcement can go inspect the tree stands um, and see that the, you know, the correct ID number is on the stand and the stand is in the correct location and maybe facing a direction that you'd expect them to be facing. So there's a lot of things you can do to control it. I have another question. Sorry, uh, Dominic, you, sorry, can we, I have a question too. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. I was going to say that, uh, so we can we can get through it. Um, but if, if if there's like clarifying questions, um, so yeah, there's a lot you can do. You can hit next three times, um, and then this is just showing off a view of the many pages of Mercer County's program. So again, you can cop. You can start with somebody else's program and pick and choose what you like and don't like, and we will have you know meetings with you guys to develop these rules and regulations. You know we. Uh, there's many, uh, many municipalities throughout the state that already have this up and running. Um, so we're not reinventing the wheel. This is something that's working um, in many parts of the state, um, including that contractor rule. Um, so I, uh, myself and Jody Towers, the deer project leader, um, we filter through the community-based deer management permits. Um, so if you wanted to go that professional route, um, you know, we can help you along with that. Uh, you can hit next. We might be... Oh, yeah, I just left Bergen County in there. You can probably, oh, probably, uh, so, um, I don't know. We, we probably want more time for discussion. I like to go through, like, the history of deer management a little bit, but we've never, I've never gone to that part of this presentation. Usually, we need more time for questions, but, yeah. So, so that, yeah, that's it. Uh, if anyone, actually, I guess we'll start with the council and there. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Oh, sure. I'll, I just have a few questions. My first question is, so, Let's say we uh, say, let's go ahead with the hunt and um, we're successful. I think someone had told me a crazy number, like we're supporting 80 deer or something like that, but we can only support six. Was it something like that? Or it, no? It's in that ballpark. Um, right. it's, it's really hard to know. And I, like those, those numbers, uh, if you're trying to get at le like that target, we know we, we kind of went over that. Um, a lot of that is the uh, cultural carrying capacity. So as you manage the deer and um, the number of deer declines, so will the negative deer people interactions. And so that can be a good way to gauge how well you should go. Um, you know, extermination is not is not the goal. But we want to get it to just an acceptable level. So it's not that goal is kind of tough to say. But yeah, uh, in places that are unmanaged, you know, a hundred deer in more rural places, two hundred deer per square mile is not uncommon. So. We are in an unmanaged area, so you, you have a high number. So, so where I'm going with that is, I assume that Rumson's right across Ridge Road has a similar ratio. So, as soon as we knock out a bunch of deer here, aren't the Rumson deer just going to move in, and we're going to have a similar yeah. issue? Are, are we just creating room for another municipality's deer? Like what? What, yeah. what has happened yeah. elsewhere? It's a, it's an interesting. I get this. This is probably the first question I get every single time. Um, and I would just like, um, without being like, I'm saying this polite, but the solution is never just to wait for your neighbor to do something. Um, I would really discourage you from thinking that way. Um, local leaders who are taking steps like you have to educate yourselves should be the ones leading the charge. And maybe that, maybe when Brumson or your other neighbors see that, you know, you've taken action, maybe they start having conversations with you and maybe take action. To answer your question directly, um, there is some amount of density dependent emigration that can occur. So when there's a lot of deer in one place and there's less deer in another place, uh, there's certain times of the year that deer will get kicked away from their moms. And, they'll, and a lot of times in certain cases, the density, if you have a lower density, they could wind up there. That's already happening. Um, a lot of their deer come to you and vice versa. Um, I would say, why would you want your deer winding up somewhere else and being someone else's problem? So, you know, I, I don't think the inaction of others really validates inaction from ourselves. You know, it's just, we want to be the good neighbor. You know, if they're not being good neighbors, we want to be the good neighbor. And that's how I would encourage you to think about it. Has, has any other local municipality been a good neighbor so far? That, in this particular in this area? area? Um, there are a number that are having conversations with us. Uh, we had a meeting with the senior, for an example. Um, uh, a lot of them that are slightly farther inland that have larger uh, property sizes are able to kind of get away with it more passively because they have 
some uh, you know wealthier landowners to have larger plots of land and can do that deer management to an extent. But uh, generally, no. I mean, we, we find that um, uh, human density, small property lot sizes, um, and frankly, more affluent parts of the state tend to be the least likely to take action on these things. But have you ever coordinated two or more municipalities doing the hunt at the same time? No, I mean, personally, I've, I've been doing this for two years. Um, so uh, we do that uh, up in Bergen County. I just had a, me a meeting a few months ago. Um, they have one municipality who said the same thing. When are you guys going to start helping out? He invited them. The other surrounding municipalities, and you know, we had a presentation to uh, 12 of the mayors and council members of uh, those different municipalities and had, and had really uh, good feedback. Three or so of them have contacted me about moving forward with it. They don't seem to be approaching it as a group. Um, it's separate. Um, that's not to say that it's not possible. It's, it's very possible. And a lot, of, a lot of times it's partnerships between like county parks and a municipality, um, things of that nature. So certainly it's everything's possible. Everything's on the table. And uh, how is it physically, is it physically marked off? when the hunt is on or on the outside, the perimeter of the area? Yeah, for, for you guys, I would 100% recommend, while, while uh, like bow hunting is certainly discreet, um, I, I would not recommend, you know, shying from public awareness on it. The public should know there should be signs up. Um, we actually have a grant where we can provide signs. Um, uh, that just was up this year and it will be available again for next year. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just, Denoting that you know when they walk when they park um, they can see okay deer management is occurring on these dates stay on the trails you know people leash your dogs people will want to know that um, not that that's necessarily a big concern it's more so a concern that they're disturbing the hunter and that process you know they're volunteering their time and you're scaring deer away that's really the concern there um, but certainly um, being open with the public about where it's occurring is is probably paramount. The last question, creating, uh, you talked about shooting from up above is safer. Mm -hmm. How are those nests created? Is that something that a hunter can do on the day that he gets yeah. there, or is that a more permanent? Yeah, it can be either way. Um, <clears throat> certainly some municipalities, it might be beneficial if you request that they keep their stands up for the season, but just assuming that there's not going to be any uh, vandalism of that. But um, it might be nice for law enforcement to be able to go inspect that stand like I said, and inspect that they're in the correct places, that they have an ID number printed on them. Um, but no, actually, you know, as technology progresses, a lot of hunters are bringing in their tree stands, it's called. Um, they pack in their tree stand um, and they remove it with them when they're done for the day. So both options are completely viable. Thank you. Um, Brian. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I, I've learned along the way that to be some of you colleagues last year. And uh, I'm really very skeptical. I, I cannot promote it. I mean, it's an urgency to this issue that it affects our public health, safety, and wealth. And we have a lot of really beautiful parkland that's suffering. My question for you is, um, because we're on a peninsula with a sort of urban cap at the semi-urban at the at the base, mm -hmm. are we in a better position to effectively? Call that deer population, even without our partner, we certainly seek out our partnership that the will of the body. But because it's more contained, mm -hmm. do, do we have a little advantage there? There's certainly an advantage. So um, we talk about, um, frankly, we talk about it a lot for our endangered and non game species, but habitat corridors are critical for the movement of wildlife. If there's a reduced number of corridors, then there should be. Um, less of those animals finding their way in. Um, and so, yeah, I think absolutely. Um, there also is um, a, uh, an effect, um, like a, I'm not gonna say it right. It's like a founder's effect where um, it takes a wild deer time to learn mm. what it's like to live in a place like this. You know, we, we see regularly that deer look both ways to cross the road, <laughs> just, well, when they do. Um, so there, you know, there's a learning that goes on. We walk right past them. If you do that in like Stoke State Forest in Sussex County, they're not doing that. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly the deer here, um, they are, you know, they live in a small area. There's less movement between populations. So I'd say absolutely, um, you're at an advantage. 
And um, but I'd still say that some amount of immigration from neighboring areas that have similar landscapes is still probably a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank sure. you. Is there a minimum area that you recommend for this type of hunting? Like yeah. We have very the natural area, but that's a pretty small area. Yeah, so an advantage is that deer move throughout the home range. So um, while it would be advantageous if you had some um, slightly larger property owners that would be willing to have that, um, that would be willing to assist. But um, I think I saw some you no know, shaking heads. Um, <laughs> The deer will um, move through those areas periodically. So um, if you allow for, um, you know, longer seasons with the hunters or probably more likely several different periods of hunting, deer will move through those areas. And you, so you can, you can have a, uh, a township-wide effect on just a few small areas. Um, sorry. The other part of that is that baiting is allowed in New Jersey. So if you guys had a handful of smaller parcels that you were like, this is where we're going to do this, you guys could put out bait to pull the deer into those areas so that you don't have to spread the hundreds out as, as much. But we did the site this year last year, and there, there was like, we went to a handful of parks, and there there's definitely area to hold hunters. Mm -hmm. um, but if that's if you guys wanted to be pulling them in specific areas, just so the hunting's only happening in one or two parks, baiting is definitely an option that we can use. So just a follow up question, though, right? So you said that the deer are within a quarter mile of each other, right? That's like their uh, so their home range is the area that they would live. Um, so uh, and, and move around throughout the year. Um, so um, yeah, so you could. Um, it, 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 a home range you can think about as like a uh, like a polygon laid over the landscape, yeah. and it's it's going to include houses. It's going to include everywhere the deer walks throughout the year. And it's about a quarter mile, you said. That's a, a rough estimate. It's been documented down to like a tenth of a mile, even less in suburban areas. So it can be extremely small for these deer. Um, but so yeah, so the reason I'm asking that, right? So we have around 1.5, 1.6 square miles of land. Mm -hmm. So how many spots right are ideal across that much square mileage mm -hmm. to have a effect right on the deer population within the entire municipality yeah it's it's more complicated than the, just that question it's going to involve looking at a map of your open spaces and your more green spaces um, of the municipality if you can sprinkle out the deer management throughout the municipality fairly well, you're going to see better results than if you have it more adjuncts, but you'll still see decent results. If you have fewer places, then maybe you want to have um, more hunting activity in those few places, as in um, instead of opening that park for a week, you might want to open it for several adjunct weeks throughout the year. Um, so, something like that. You know, it's, it's a broader discussion, but just to answer your question, kind of simply. Sure. Yeah. Ooh. How often is my question, and what happens to the deer? Pardon? How often will we would we need to do this, yeah. and what happens to the deer? So yeah, so uh, um, it would be occurring no matter what you do. It is not a one and done. Right. One of the advantages to lethal management is that once you remove those deer that year, if the if the uh, political temperature of, of your municipality changes, um, you have a turnover in who's sitting there. Um, you still have, that has still accomplished that that goal. Those deer have been removed, and so if you still accomplish that short term goal, there will be short term positives from that, and some longer term positives. Um, but no matter what, it is a continuous thing on some scale. Effort is going to be it, it's an interesting little balance. But when you have a lot of deer, it takes a little bit of effort to find those deer and remove them, or do whatever what you're going to do to them. As there are fewer deer, it might take the volunteers a little longer to um, be able to remove the deer. Um, but regardless, over the time scale, um, unless you extirpate them and keep them out, which is just probably not going to happen with Lumsden and others. Um, are you talking like once a year, every six months? It needs to occur annually. Okay. Um, okay. And um, probably at the get go, you probably want to be more liberal and you probably want to um, close, if you're going to close the parks or just let it happen. You, you want it to occur. Uh, our seasons are open about six months. Um, I would I would be I would discourage you from opening it less than a month, and it could be adjunct periods. Um, 
Uh, and it will kind of depend on how successful they are from the get-go. So it, it of course, I mean, it's, deer, it's Do people take the venison? Like what happens to the deer? Well, yeah, with the deer, yeah. Um, that's part of that wanton waste. It's a law. Um, if somebody harvests the deer, they have to retain all the edible portions of the deer. So they take the deer with them. Okay. You can require them to take even the guts with them. So um, part of the process, so part of the process to, you know, it's like, you know, from butchering an animal to getting to the edible, um, it is removing the guts. Typically on our state lands, the guts are just left in the field. Um, and um, and that lets the temperature of the animal uh, decrease more, much more rapidly than if you did not do that. And so it's better for retaining the meat, but you could still require that the hunters remove that. Um, so that there's no no like chance of a dog um, or something like that. And, 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 and bigger open spaces, it's less. Than that's right, that was my question. You guys can also work with um, uh, we have a yeah, I guess a partner um, HHH, which stands for Hunters Helping the Hungry. That's right. And they actually have a refrigerated trailer now. So if you guys have like a week, two week span where you're really pushing mm -hmm. that those are the two weeks that you guys want to take the most out, mm -hmm. they'll come park the trailer here. Right. And they can the hunters can drop their deer off, and then HHH takes it with them, and they'll donate it to a local soup pantry. So you. then you're also giving back to your community through doing this too. So they they donate millions of pounds of venison every year. Yeah, if you go with contracted hunting, that's legally required. If you're getting going with volunteers, um, the volunteers are doing it for meat for their families. So you know you might want to let them keep some of it. Um, you can work that out with you know, whatever you. So it sounds very safe that the measures that you've taken. Um, is there anything sort of belt and suspenders uh, where maybe you have it during the school uh, time when the kids aren't, aren't you know, not on the weekend, but you know, during the week? Yeah. The school, do you do that kind of thing? Or, Absolutely. Or also, more? just um, deer are what's called crepuscular. So everyone knows like raccoons are nocturnal. Mm -hmm. um, we are diurnal. Crepuscular means most active in the uh, dawn and dusk. Mm -hmm. And so um, the hunters are going to come out before sunrise. They're going to be sitting and waiting for the sun to rise um, if you allow it in the morning. Um, they'll harvest the deer in the morning and then um, they'll probably be out pretty early. If you close the park, um, then they might be out all day and that might be very advantageous for you. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know. Kind of the world is your oyster. You can do, you can make what uh, restrictions that you want with it if if you perceive any of these safety issues. So you could you know do as much or as little um, to stop uh, the public from entering these parks if, if you think that's necessary. Um, in yours, it's probably a nice idea. I don't think it's really ever super necessary because frankly, uh, it's deer and people look quite different. Um, it's more so disturbing the hunters, in all honesty, and being respectful of their volunteer time. Um, a lot of times they're taking off work to do this. So um, it's kind of interesting to think of it that way, but that really is, you know, if they're, if, so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I would encourage you to think about it. But certainly, you can do it only during the, uh, the middle of the day. Um, something that is somewhat popular is to have it um, occur in the evening only, and that way when the hunters are moving the carcass, you know, it's nighttime, people can't see as much. But again, we drive past deer carcasses every day and don't think twice. So um, I'll kind of uh, encourage you to, you know, just be uh, a little bit more uh, welcome to this long okay. Just last question. Thank you for entertaining you all. Um, mm -hmm. How long has Fish and Wildlife been supporting the lethal management programs and how many municipalities have participated since then? Great. Yeah, we just finished that the last one. So, um, in terms, of, uh, I think we were founded in the eight, late 1800s, about the 1860s, I think. Um, so we've been managing our deer uh, legally since then. Funny enough, the history thing that we didn't go over. Uh, a deer biologist back then would be thinking about having more deer because we nearly extirpated them with market hunting for their hides. Mm -hmm. um, so they were shot uh, to near extinction uh, up in Northwest Jersey. We had some deer. We had no turkeys. Turkeys were reintroduced. I believe we moved deer throughout the state to reintroduce them. Um, and then with uh, urban sprawl um, and just changes and the way humans uh, interact with wildlife, um, it's kind of turned into the opposite where, um, you know, hunting seems like that kind of dirty thing that happens in Stoke State Forest and not here. Um, so uh, in terms of the number of municipalities, um, we don't have a good number for that because a lot of municipalities passively allow it. Um, even to the extent that they just simply don't prohibit hunters from going on the municipal lands uh, to do that. So it is like that unmanaged hunt. In a lot of these areas, 
it is more of a formal program. And I would say it's on the order of probably like 30 or so, if I had to just guess on a like pretty strictly managed hunt. Um, we have about uh, five to seven community-based permits, you know, on that high end where, you know, people are paying contractors. A lot of, you know, a lot of cases are paying contractors uh, to do that service. Um, but that's kind of the ballpark. Um, it's, you know, uh, it's hard to answer some of these questions because it is, it's very tailored to an individual municipality. So, um, but I'll say conversations like this, it's on that. Awesome. Municipality. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to open for the public? That's up to you. I, I think, I think we push that to agenda items only, but I don't know if you guys can hang around for. Oh yeah, we can wait till the end uh, if you want. For oh, yeah. it won't be the end. It'll be uh, we gotta get through a workshop here. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, we're on the side. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're gonna go to workshop session. Eagle Scout project concept. Jack Rodriguez is here. Hello, Jack. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Jack. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, hi, I'm Jack Rodriguez. Uh, I'm a Boy Scout, a part of the Fair and Troop, and I'm going to be presenting my Eagle Scout project for central approval. Uh, to start, should I just put this? Uh, to begin, I'd just like to explain what an Eagle Scout project is. Uh, it's a project to gain the rank of Eagle Scout in the Boy Scout community, and it's a project to benefit your local community in like a positive way. As sort of a donation thing, since all the money will be fundraised fundraised for this, uh, it's more of like a donation to the community. Uh, so my Eagle Scout project is going to be a bike repair station. There should be a picture in all of your packets. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing it to oh, thank you. Uh, so there should be a picture in all your packets of what the bike repair station would look like. It'll have some like uh what's it called um tools yeah what tools on wires sticking out yeah that's what it's gonna look like uh it'll have tools on wires that you can pull out to be able to fix up the parts of your bike uh and it'll have a stand so you can put your bike on it like that this would most likely go in fair fields uh under the overhanging session stand in the concrete area it would, there is a couple other locations in family fields I could put it, we could put it, but it would, like the main area that we want to put it is under the consent stand for a couple reasons. If we were to put it like next to the bike rack, to the like uh, side of the consent stand, where there's a grass area, there'll just be a lot more like money to dig up, put concrete in, and then nail, uh, and screw it in. While under the consent stand, we just kind of like, nail it into the concrete. Along with that, the overhang and the concession stand could also like protect it from the elements and make the lifespan of the stand last longer. Mm -hmm. And there was one more thing. Oh yeah. Um about the maintenance of the stand. According to like the Boy Scouts, uh for an Eagle Scout project, we're not allowed to have like a warranty or like kind of maintain it since it's supposed to be like a donation to the community. But there wouldn't be really many repairs that you would need to do on it. It would last like 10 to 15 years. It's just kind of like a metal pole that sticks in the ground. So uh, uh, the reason that I'm doing this is because in Farrington, there's like a big biking community that we have. So I think it would be a very like beneficial project for all like people in Farrington to be able to fix their bikes like on the fly. And in Farrington Fields uh, at the concession stand is a place that a lot of people with their bikes would be. So it's a very convenient area and a very convenient project for people and bikers in Farrington. And the last thing to be able to move forward with this project would just be to get approval from the council so we could like get this moving. Good job. Great job, Jack. 
So are you, are you proposing, um, I see the bike repair station cost is roughly $1,100. Yes. And then you wrote installation materials have been installed in soil is roughly $500. Are you covering both of those or is that 500 part of the 1100? That 500 would be added on. So we're planning to fundraise $2,000. We can have okay. some extra leftover if we need any like materials that we haven't accounted for at this point. So we're planning to raise $2,000, but the actual station that we would buy would be a lot of dollars. Got it. And and I see best locations. Is that the location you want the most? Is North Exposure number one? Is that what you're proposing? Uh, underneath yeah, right next underneath to the, the awning? Yeah, under the awning next to the water fountain is the main area that we want. And then another reason that that would be good is because there's like some surveillance cameras there. So if anyone were to like, if there were were to be a part of it that may have broken, we'd be able to see what happened. Sure. Do you need access to electricity? I see you have an air pump here. Oh, that's just going to be manual. You'll just like pop it like this. So we'll need electricity for that. Jack, have you ever used one of these? Yeah, The actually the reason I thought of this idea was I was hiking in Hartshorn Woods and one of these was there mm -hmm. next to one of the stands like for a map. Uh, there was one of the stations there. So that's where I got the idea from. I love this. You can't put a price tag on not having to put your children's bike in the back of a car and drive to Shrewsbury. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love my yeah. I love bike chains. Oh, yeah. Done. Yeah. So, um, uh, <laughs> I love it, Jackets. Is there um is there a reason to take a spin cast parks and rec? Sorry, this, um obviously this body will make a decision, that, but is there the DJ of Parks and Rec want to weigh in on the location? Oh yeah, we were gonna discuss this with uh him on the like the specifics of the location in Fairfield Fields. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we could probably if if there's support, approve this and then like also someone, do what you're yeah. suggesting. Again. If someone wants to make a motion or if someone has more I'll questions. Make a, no, I'll make a okay. motion. I'll second, second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Good job, John. Thanks, Thanks for having me. I'm sorry. A couple signatures and you Absolutely. <laughs> um, in the meantime, uh, sign request for Farrington Farmers Market. With a cute sweatshirt. Well, thank you. Don't be sad. Don't be sad. That's just fun. These two. We want to share. Here, can show. Maybe we're in our packet, right? At least. Um, was not this specific. Was the actual size. Yeah. One of them, and then get back to the no neon. No, no date. Okay. <laughs> Not with this. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a presentation that we just, I think, is still in the press. Mm -hmm. Let me take a look at the he could do it. Okay, yeah. Um, so we're 10 days, just about 10 days out from our first mm -hmm. very farm is very good. So um we're excited about it. We're planning some signs to put around town, um, a kind of different uh, varying degree of um sizing and location and uh, some of the print on there. So what you guys have in, in front is what we would like to get approved. Um, we have, is that right? That's okay. That's okay. Um, the printout that the, the majority of you have is what we're looking, what we're gonna be looking at. That's our, our 
website that we put up. So um, we have quite a few street signs that we're looking to get approved, as well as a few banners similar to the Dermer Dreams banners that are up right now. Same locations, same size, same printer. We have some wooden, like authentic farmer's market that we actually sawed and painted <laughs> that we would like to use as well, just to kind of tie in that feel. Um, the majority of them would be pretty uh, basic, no uh, specific dates because there are multiple dates, we'd be able to reuse them. Some of them would be interchangeable. We could swap in with the next date is. Our plan is to hopefully put them out the Friday or Thursday before to continue to generate the buzz. Um, so anything in that packet is really what we're looking for approval on tonight. Okay, did you say street sign or no? Did you say street? Uh, there's a few of the the eight like eight yeah eight, oh, eight 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 signs that we'd be able to okay. yeah. Um, when you said you're going to put them out before, do you mean the day of signs or the advanced signs? Well, we would put one maybe the A frame signs to make sure that the location is clear to some people coming in. Then there are the ones that where the Dermers signs currently are at the entrance of Fairhaven and then the one that Fairhaven Fields is in there. Mm -hmm. right. 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 So that, that would go up when it got close to the day. That's right. Is it the same with the wooden signs? You only put them up no, when it gets close? Those the wooden signs would be day up. Okay. Those, those, say, those ones charming. say advanced signage. That's not the these Dermers, ones? The, I, those would not be advanced. Not would, advanced. No, 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 those are clunky, big pieces of wood. The advanced signage would be the Dermers, Dreamers sign locations, same size, same spots. So, just and then the A frames would probably be up the night before. So none of this stuff stays up from May twenty fifth until October. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> the wood ones. Where were the wood ones going to go? Um, right in the market. So that's what I thought. So there was the the clearing that was done behind Sickles. Mm -hmm. So that has a little area. We're going to set up a few signs, kind of connecting that path. Put one of the wooden signs there, and then the gates of the old McCarter Estate. We would probably put one under there with the wheelbarrow, and some chalk, mm -hmm. like that sorts of different stuff. Just to and ask a couple more questions. Okay. So uh, just going in your presentation, you said identify and amp um, amplify no parking locations on the resident street. Wouldn't that wouldn't that really be up to the I think meeting? we would I like, met with we, 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 we talked about all that. Yeah, right. yeah, that's why I figured it'd be that was a previous I just we added it in case it was something we needed to do, but she was right. so. and then the other one you said that um located at the entrance of McCarter Park was, and beside frame it yourself. Do we have to get any Approval from frame it yourself. That's for a property. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was the area. That okay. Just right by there. That's where you're talking about. That's it. Okay. When do you anticipate removing all of the signage? Saturday. That's yeah. Saturday of yeah. the morning. Yeah. So we go up a day or two before the market right. and we come down the day of the market. Yeah. Just on that borough property, there, there's an agreement in place, though, that the owners are to maintain that uh, landscaped area. Just FYI. So we say it's borough property, but that entire area there, there's a there's an actual agreement with all the businesses. Um, and it's from 13 Smart years Star. ago. Smart, Smart Start, Frame It, Fairwinds, and the borough property. So it's not borough property. It's borough yeah. owned. T do you want to explain it? It's borough owned, but the actual maintenance of the landscaping is not the borough's responsibility. We just figured it out. They, yeah. they the borough. Company. <clears throat> just the, we actually worked with the, the owners there and they had to clear. Yeah. Just want to like yeah. just yeah. want to be clear. So should we check with them? Um you fine. No, they're aware. Are we, are we sent them the email. They know why we wanted to. Do yeah, we've been in there. We were yeah. in the frame yourself a few days ago. So my only comment on the on the sandwich board signs that you put them up, you have to be very careful. Many of our sidewalks are narrow, mm -hmm. and and you can't block pedestrians or people with smaller mm -hmm. issues. You're gonna have to pick locations where that won't be a problem. Yeah. You know, like you could actually, you know, if you want to tap one in here in front of our hall, but then you put it, you know, off the center of the pathway yeah. as opposed to right in the sidewalk itself. But I'll be, I'll be walking. <laughs> <laughs> Double line. Yeah. So you can be the real time. Anyone have a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the signage sign. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Congrats. We're really excited for you. All right. Next up, a request from the Fairhaven PTA to hold a color run event on September 22nd, 2024. Hi. Oh. Hello. Back. 
another <laughs> race, another day of fun. Um, so the color run was something done by the Education Foundation previously. It stopped um, right before COVID, pretty much in that zone. Um, the PTA has identified some social emotional learning I don't say deficits, but need for encouraged group play at recess at those schools and um, looking to be able to provide some funds for enhancements to encourage group play, such as the Gaga pit that we already did, but it brought up more ideas from people of other things that we could add at both schools. Um, so we discussed with the previous people that did it about the color run and bringing that as a vehicle of having kid participation and raising the funds to add to their fund. So we're looking to do that on September 22nd. Um, Stephanie Wenzel will be the person in town in charge of the race, and she has met with those that did the color run in the past to get all the information about how it was won. They previously got approved for a thousand runners. We don't know that we would actually have that, but we just went back to what did they ask for and did they get approved for. Um, so I thought, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so I've seen and participated in color runs and depending on the age of the kids, you know, it could be a very short run, which is just fine. Also it contains the color every time of the time. What's the vision for? So for they the had a fun run and a longer run okay. when they did. So they had a kid one and an adult mm -hmm. version. So, and there is a discussion of just going to a kid and not even the full long run mm -hmm. that the adults did. Mm -hmm. um, I know the one that I participate in on over Memorial Day is about a mile mm -hmm. total. Mm -hmm. um, but that is something that is still being worked on on how long the actual long run will be. But the kid run was just within Fairhaven Fields so that they were safe and contained yeah. previously. Okay. Do you have a yeah. rain date? Um, yeah, so it will be the next weekend is the expected rain date. We've been working with, um, speaking with the uh, Fairhaven Foundation has Oktoberfest that Saturday and whether or not it would work. And we were even considering that to be the initial date. Um, because we're trying to stay further away from Harvest Fest if possible, because that's in October. So um, the discussion that we had with the people running October Fest was that it would be possible, it would be a little tight, but it would be possible based on what would be left sure. behind the next morning. It's just not ideal. So we're gonna hope that it doesn't come to that. <laughs> so the, the request would be the event on the 22nd of September with the rain date for 29 20th. September. Okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. okay. You have a time. Um, no, they did the fun run at 9 a.m. previously. Yeah. We're basically just following the, um, about two weeks ago, Stephanie met with um, the people that were in charge of that and just is running through all of their back information on how they did it. I have a question. Yes. So your rain date is the 29th? Correct. Now, I know Oktoberfest is scheduled for the 28th. So do you, and, and it's not always taken down, no, that's why it's not our ideal date, but um, after discussing it with Susan and where the barriers would be and what space we would be using versus what so that would be, it would be, she said, it is doable. It is not ideal. Right. So you don't see a conflict? No. And, and it was better when we went back and forth, it was better to still be dealing with cleanup on Sunday morning versus being in the way and then having the color there the morning before, which is why we were sticking with the Sunday. Street closers, DPW support. So I'm working on street closers for girls on the run currently, and I was holding off to see if this so I could do both. But it would be if the they used to use the same route the girls on the run was when they did the full race, but that was a full 5k, and we have been discussing whether or not you really want to do the full 5k or to cut that down. Hundred yard dash. But it would be the same what? Hundred yard dash. Yeah. <laughs> and DPW support. Yeah, that was that was all fine because in the past it was fine. They the main color part from what I, was just described to me because I asked this question was that it was they did like an enclosed area that you like basically went into a a sectioned off zone yeah. to get colored. Yeah, when you got colored so that it contained where it was. Right. Yeah. So what actually is the expectation of DPW? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what is what is the I mean most of the, I understand that just filters in one day of rains. I mean, are you expecting to come in and evacuate the color? That's not the proper. Color. No, and, right. and it it is. It's just hosing it. Yeah, yeah. That's so, my understanding. And my understanding was that it was never previously. We do anticipate paying a fee 
like other, I mean, that was part of the discussion of the budget that we might have to pay. For. Okay. Well, I guess for the zoning, I didn't see, I wasn't sure there was a need. I didn't even think there is. It sounds like we're still working on it. Maybe we need. Um, I, it, it was following what was done in the past. Yeah. Nothing that's a good my kids have ever, ever no. experienced. It was the first thing we ever did in Fairhaven. <laughs> they still talk about it. Um, it was very contained, and I live across the street from Fairhaven Field. Yeah, uh, my understanding was it was not an issue, but that they were prepared to, because I think for girls on the run, there's a fee. So I had brought up, we, we need to budget in that there would be that participation fee, which is supposed to go to cover any of the needs that come up. Right. I know we call them, we power watch it ahead of, uh, so okay. in the past, I think it might depend on the timing if you're lucky enough to get some rain. Right. Yeah, I think but it, 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 it kind of disperses pretty quickly right. from what I would call. Yeah, we're trying we're to put it in our kids. Yeah. <laughs> Judicial, <laughs> that's the word, a very, very um, uh, and the reason why I'm saying I'm not here, it was come up, yeah. it, yeah, it, no, it was, oh, yeah, it was explained to me that it wasn't an issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't well, like that goes on the turn of the participants. So, the reason I brought it up just to clarify is, um, we're being careful with where our DPW crew gets deployed on the weekends. And I don't actually think that there is a DPW need for the call. I wouldn't think. Yeah, I, I'm saying it's not. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. And there'll be quarter potties rented. So they want to be using the bathroom. That's in the budget. I know that because I checked on that. What is the actual color? Just out of curiosity, is it toxic? Is it non toxic? It's, it's, yes, my it's not toxic. It's, not it's okay for kids. It's, it's, yeah. They wear sunglasses and they get a t shirt, so the t shirt kind of gets colored. But then even when you wash the t shirt, it's. Yeah. Gone. I mean, I figured, but we that's okay. that I mean, I'm, yes. No, no, that's I mean, that's I'm definitely not talking about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In the past, you can't go stunt glasses. Yes. They all get it. Everyone gets a pair of glasses to protect their eyes. Will it will this group report through the Parks and Rec Committee? Like, follow Yes, we went to the Parks and Rec first. Perfect. I just didn't know that. And that was, and it had gone through Parks and Rec first, so that's why it was kind of easy even when I brought it up to yeah. Rec. I wasn't actually on the first meeting when it came up, but when it came up, it was, it was, there was information back from how it was done in the past, and it awesome. was approved very well. And it was very successful. Yeah. Yes. My only, my only request in the full support, my only request would be if anything deviates, if you can bring it back to the right. governing body, please. If we're going to change anything, please. We would bring it back. That would be super appreciative. Thank you. I'll make a motion. More in front of signs. Are you doing any kind of event long signs or anything? So right now we were we were going to put in a separate request because I didn't think I could throw that in at this time, but we were going to put in a, a separate request for the um September 6th. It's, so it's after Labor Day. Let's do a separate, yes. And yeah, that's if that's all right. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve. One second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for putting that together. Uh, Bicentennial Hall Repair Plan, Councilman La Barbera. Yep, so um, as the governing body knows, Tracy and I um, have been working really hard on getting the four components of the big hall um, plan overall uh, going. And the ultimate goal is that Bicentennial Hall is in a maintainable state after the AD upgrades, uh, after punch list items, um, and so we went back and we got, um, years ago, 10, 12 years ago, mm -hmm. there was a, a 10 year maintenance plan done, um, that looked at both the historic and non-historic components. And so we went back, uh, to the original author, as well as another entity that supported, they got two proposals. So, um, we wanted to raise that here. We've been talking about it tangentially a little bit, um, in our governing body meetings. Uh, the proposal difference is uh, one was 1500 one was 7500 And so um, with the governing body support, we'd like to uh, make a recommendation for the next meeting to have it approved. Um, and when we look at our schedule, we're, we're looking for um, our big call efforts, ADA, punch list, and the repair plan to be done before the fall-ish. Before the holidays. Before the holidays. Um, so it's kind of aligned with all the little concurrent things. So... We didn't want to just, you know, put it on a consent agenda one. I want to bring it back here, put some hot, you know, a focus light on. Do you get ahead? Um, the only thing, which is what we talked about with the stakeholder group, um, these two proposals for one product are pretty different in their in their fee, which we really want to hire the lowest, most um, inexpensive proposal. 
We did talk about that professional's ability to do the research to guide us with historical uh, design things, in particular, something like the paint color for Bicentennial Hall, internal and external. And I don't think we tracked that down. So I guess what I wanted to say here is let's do that before there's a plan to put it in front of council for consideration. Just make sure that Laura Berwin has the, either or perhaps Teresa, you may know, does she have the capacity or the understanding or the yeah, kind of research to guide us as to things like all of It's in there, but it is a very, it's a very she, proposal. When she shot back the proposal. Yeah. They, they both were, but when she shot back the proposal, I mean, she, I mean, I'll let you speak to it. It's fine. I, I, I concur. And she, she also, I mean, she's presented the, uh, you know, she helped us in the past when we were looking for things through SHPO, and she has a lot of experience with historical buildings. So, so you feel uh, confident about I'm confident in her abilities. I really am. Okay. The research piece is a unique one that doesn't necessarily mean every architect has that. But if, if that's the case, I agree. That's our recommendation. Move forward. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Um, we, we just approved an application for a grant. Mm -hmm. Didn't we just do that? Like that $50,000 grant cap mm -hmm. that was going to help us, uh, create a plan for a bicentennial hall. Is that yes. that's not? So well, different type of plan. Right. Okay, uh, that's that's where my what what is the difference between the two? So plans? this is a maintenance plan. What you need to do to maintain Bicentennial Hall, given its mixture of historical and non-historical components. The grant was down to the program, and I don't want to speak for Michael and Tracy, but but the grant was focused on programming that you could put through Bicentennial Hall. Uh, use of the building, what type of use could it be for the public and the community, et cetera. So two very different types of grants. So well, there's, there's no perfect. chance of um, any contradiction between two plants. No, one's there's one's no one's redundancy, one's I think physical. is what you're mm -hmm. This is like the physical work that needs to get done now. And then that would follow up after all this work is done and after a maintenance plan has come up, mm -hmm. has been figured out, then we figure out the actual use of the building. Okay, we'll, so we'll so the use. grant will not include anything on maintenance. No. Right. no. Okay. Or development. It's just it's just programs that are or the actual use of the building yes. and whether if we decide we need better A A V system, mm -hmm. can it support it? How would we make that happen? Okay. As long as there's no conflict between the two. No. Yeah. No. So what's the funding source? This is an um, existing capital. Uh, I, I actually uh, have to double check on the soft cost in the ordinance that was approved for Bicentennial Hall, but I'm fairly sure there'd be soft costs available. It's not a it's not a significant amount of money. So if if that was not the case from a timing perspective, I'm not so sure it make the 2024 budget. I think by the time they do the punch list and get some of the, the repairs done, it might make the 2025 budget. Yeah. But I'll double check with Bob Council. I, I'm, you know, they they dropped that in several years ago, but I'm sure there was some level of soft cost in there. And we 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 I'm operating under the assumption that it's covered under the bond ordinance specifically for Bicentennial Hall that talks through hard costs and soft yeah. costs, notwithstanding the um, ADA grant. Right, so the ADA grant was 100 and whatever thousand. Then the other facilities cost specifically for Bicentennial, which included soft and hard, yeah, 374, whatever it was. So I'm operating under the assumption that this comes out of the bond ordinance. That's been the plan. Um, all that's so we'll get, we'll get those answers before the next time. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, it, if it's not on the agenda next time, then that's not the case. <laughs> we have to think through that. Can I just clarify though, timing wise, because we're yes. of the mind that. This is going to hopefully be done possibly by fall, so it would fall within 2024. Correct. Yeah. Right. That's like, why we need to get confirmation yeah. there. Okay. Yep. okay. Uh, next up, public comment on agenda items only. Uh, please observe a three minute time limit. I know that there's people here probably for different reasons. If we could, just because uh, our friends from NJDP are here, can we get through the deer stuff first and then we'll move on? So, if anyone that has a deer public comment, please. Come up, state your name and address for the record, um, and please limit uh, your comments to three minutes. Hi, my name is Callum Ferguson, 720 Court. I'm the chair of the Natural Area Advisory Committee. Uh, we have a number of members here. They were very excited to listen to the presentation tonight. 
Um, uh, we have shared information with you, but I just want to restate some of it so that the public hears our story in combination with what was presented. Uh, so for the last three years, we've been requesting the council to take some sort of action on deer overpopulation, especially as it's affecting the natural area. Uh, so we really want to thank the council and thank you guys for making your presentation because it's been something our committee has been eager uh, to work on. Um, in the natural area, we have observed destruction. Uh, we've observed it, the members of the committee, uh, the employees that care for the park have observed it, and also the Mount County Park experts who advise us have observed it. And what we've observed is the destruction of the younger soil, and then also what you described, which was the destruction of the young trees. Um, so in a normal, Occurrence trees in the natural area fall all the time. Every time we have a rainstorm, a windstorm, large trees fall. Uh, what should be there ready to spring up are small trees, young trees to take their place. But what we're seeing is that the deer have eaten these young trees and we wind up really with no trees. Um, so really without some sort of action, the future of the forest in the natural area is at risk. Um, we've also heard people make similar comments about the Harding Bird Sanctuary. Um, and that's a little more easy to observe. You drive by and you just see trees and you don't see anything underneath it. Um, so the Natural Area Advisory Committee does hope that some type of action will be taken. Um, and we just want to share one thought. Uh, we have the restoration area in the Northwest, which is currently a cleared area. Um, and that is, it was previously cleared of vines and nasty uh, thorny trees and stuff, but it's now a clear open area. And you know that we had the gentleman from Weeds Inc. out to talk to us, and he observed that that might be a good place to hold a deer hunt if one were to be hold, held. Um, it's surrounded by very tall trees, and it would be easy to put deer stands up there. Uh, he suggested that it's kind of a, a large enough area, but it is contained or could be contained. And um, it would be easy enough to bait in that area and then uh, have people in trees uh, working. So uh, we think that's something that you should at least consider. And we want to make sure you know about that. And that's it. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Does anyone else have a public comment on the deer issue? Um, Carolyn has covered most of this, so I don't need to say very much. Um, I just want to stress the significance of sustainment provided by the existence of an understory. It's sort of the center feature of a natural area. It allows, it's the critical feature of the natural um, sustained we call it sustainable ecology. It's also extremely important for the enjoyment of people in the park, because without it, you see directly through to the houses, to the other trails, to the people walking on the trails, you hear the people, and you hear the noise. Mm -hmm. That's gone. Mm -hmm. So I want to be just a little bit more explicit on the final point. When can we expect you guys to be ready to to take this on. Uh, I don't want to overcommit and under deliver, but um, I've already been asked that question <laughs> since NJDP presented. Uh, my best guess is we're going to put it on workshop as soon as you know we we find the right meeting to do that. I would I would say um, it'll be sooner rather than later, but that that means it's a workshop, so you need to get support from the governing body. For a hunt before we actually move forward, but the discussion as to whether we're we're going to have support to move forward is going to be happening soon. I urge you to include the natural area folks, and I I think you asked the question of to break down the parks. We have roughly a hundred acres, right? Forty five for the natural area, thirty two for the uh, recreation area, six for the uh, bird sanctuary, and it sort of tails off. There are two other large ones, I guess. Mm -hmm. The Carter Park and Center Park, but they're below six and then it tails off. So there are not a lot of small areas 
that aren't forced to students. So that's going to be an interesting problem. I think designing the program would be the place should should the governing body determine that it's a good idea to go forward. Then there's a phase of work where you're designing the program along with the technical advisors that are here tonight. Perhaps there's a role for I don't want to get ahead as mayor said, but I, I do think we need a long term plan. Yeah. It's not just a one shot deal, right? I believe in immigration. And I just don't see how deer know which street is between and which street isn't between. <laughs> it's depends on your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on deer? No? Well, let's uh let's give a quick round of applause for Brian and Meg. <laughs> The public on agenda items only. Um, Jack Rice, I'm specifically here about um, number one twenty five, the resolution. Anyway, I'm here because. You wrote a resolution removing Brian for conduct on becoming a, a volunteer. He has requested from both the mayor and Teresa um, a written explanation as to what that conduct was, and it was never answered. He was told that it would not be discussed, and I would really like an explanation as to why he's being removed and what that conduct is. I don't think that it's fair that he has been a volunteer in this town for well over 20 years and he's being removed without any kind of a conversation or having a full understanding. And I would urge every member on this council to not pass that resolution. Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> Is there anyone else in the public with a public comment on agenda items? Same agenda item. My name is Gary. I do not live in Fairhaven, but I am, I do live in one of the towns that benefits from the work that Brian has done with the Never Saint River um, Municipality Committee. Um, I have a long background in fisheries management issues and conservation. Um, spent 12 years on the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council as the governor's appointee. Long before that, I worked on strike bass legislation, testified with the Congress, and I've written about it for many magazines. Um, the work that Brian has done with this committee, bringing it back to life, has benefited all of the municipalities that border on the river. And I think that they all, I think that if you move forward with removing him from the committee, you're penalizing all of us, not just fair hate. Um, I know that the river has had a lot of pollution problems in the past, and they've been addressed. He knows the people to work with. He's brought on Cindy Zick, Clean Ocean Action. He has great um, relationships with NJDEP, the right people. When he was doing research on what needed to be done, he actually contacted my brother. My brother is an environmental engineer with one of the most prestigious environmental engineering companies that works with clean water, well, remediation. Um, the amount of time that he puts in, the amount of research, you don't find volunteers like that every day, especially people who are willing to not just put in the time to come to committee meetings, but the intense research that's, in, that's involved in preparing for it. So I just wanted to say that I would like to see Brian stay where he is as in, on the committee representing Fairhaven because he has been the driving force behind this committee and the success it's seen over the last five years. Sure. Thank Gary, you. thank you for your comments. Anyone else with a public comment? Agenda items only? Oh. I'm your neighbor, Rumson. I had a uh, commercial shop up in Keyport. We harvest blue crabs. Just your name, please. Dennis Cavanaugh. And uh, my real love is shellfish. Real too old to be shellfish anymore. So what I do do is uh, aquaculture. 
aquaculture in 22, we actually outlanded the wild harvest in the United States. They grew more than they caught. Now, that probably doesn't mean much to you, but down in Seabright and Highlands, there's a huge payroll. And those guys have to pay to get their plants going. Now, if that case that comes up right now in this summer between the Cape May fishermen and the Supreme Court, that fee that they have to pay may go away. Where's it going to go? They'll end up coming to the shoreline. I live in Rumson, Fairhaven. All those shorelines are going to be absorbed in that expense. It's a big, big payroll. Brian was a dialogue. I've been doing this for a long time. I was able to get that $18 million for uh, Mom's Park. That was me. $250,000 was paid back to the fishermen for landing fees. That was also me. So I'm good at this. But Brian negotiates. We don't always agree, but he was very productive. Before you cut him loose, make sure if you lose that dialogue. If you lose that dialogue, you can get expensive real quick. Do you ever cry, sir? Thank you. Thank you for your comments, yeah. Dennis. Is there anyone else in the public? The public on? Hello? Hi, I'm Mike Cristola, 66 Gillespie Avenue, Fairhaven. Uh, I've been in town now for just over 12 years. I live on the river, but I think more importantly, I spent a ton of time on the river. Um, and what Brian has done for the, for the group, I think uh, some of it goes unrecognized. Uh, Probably about seven or eight years ago, they're they're leading the charge to make our river a marine sanctuary, which would have been a huge mistake and was flying under the radar. Uh, Brian and a group stepped up to help protect the river and keep it accessible for all of us. Uh, a lot of people know me in town as a guy that drives around in a blue truck, but I actually sit on an international board uh, that leads the that leads in the, the International Game Fish Association. I'm a trustee, and we spend a lot of time protecting fisheries. And I get the fortunate advantage of being on that board, meeting a lot of people that are dedicated to protecting uh, our environment as fishermen and clean water. And Brian is as dedicated as a lot of the people I meet all over the world that are uh, involved with doing so. Um, uh, Barry said it was spot on with, with his connections and his ability to bring people together. Uh, it's a shame to lose them. Uh, I think you guys need to reconsider that. Uh, frankly, without an explanation of why you're taking them off, I think it's premature. Um, and who we're replacing them? Because I doubt who we're replacing them with has the credentials that Brian has. And it'd be a shame to go backwards. The river, after the marine sanctuary, had a lot of water quality issues that some of you are aware of. I think that hits home a little harder for most people. Uh, Brian led the charge with getting that under control. And finding out, you know, where where some of the major sources of this pollution is coming from. So, please reconsider it. Uh, I know other people will probably have other stuff to say that might be redundant to what I'm saying, or you know, but it's important to listen to what the people that are involved with the river, that spend time on the river, that know the river, have to say about this. So, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time, Mike. Yeah. Anyone else with a public comment on agenda items only? Good evening. Brian Rice, 45 Maple Avenue. Mm -hmm. I had to write this down because many of you know me that I could get off the course. And I believe I'm here tonight because of recent disagreements as to future policy with Fairhaven. Things like the public dock and the river are my life. And I'm passionate about preserving these resources for future generations. I think many of you know my byline, which is to leave this place better than what we found it. I'm an outspoken supporter. Many of you know that clearly outspoken. Supporter of the public access to great greatest assets of the peninsula, the water and the human and animal life that thrives around. For that, I am not sorry, but proud for all that I've done and have accomplished for our community. But I am here tonight. Disagreement about new policies now threaten my continued right as a passionate resident of Fairhaven to remain actively involved in shaping those policies for the future. But just as I want to keep fighting for the river, I'm here to appeal to this council to reverse course, permit me to remain active on these committees, 
one committee and the process of protecting these invaluable, irreplaceable public resources. I would need to be completely unconscious to not realize through this proposed action tonight that I have clearly upset some of you who do not share all my views and as to, and as to how we should set policy for the future. I can tell you here tonight that I have never intended to hurt anyone and any else and diminish anyone else's opinion or to overstep my bounds. I, as just one vocal member of this great community. But the truth is I am imperfect and times I struggle to, my wife's here still, struggle to, um, those struggle to, let me start, at times I struggle to control how I display my passion and lobby for what I believe in. But those that know me and I am for here in this room tonight know that what drives me is firmly planted in my heart. And when the passion comes from the heart and the goal is truly a public good, I would hope there could be more understanding and tolerance of the personal flaws of one human just trying to do the best they can to lobby for what we believe in, what I believe in. I've given a lot of myself for this community over my whole life, and I'm here tonight in the an enviable position of needing to ask you to permit me to continue to work hard for this community moving forward. I believe I'm unique, uniquely situated to support these community assets, and I believe that removing me from participating in these committees would be great disservice to our community. I implore you to reconsider banning me from continued participation in these important public activities, and in exchange, because it is me, and I do know I have a part in this, I promise to work harder to do better in managing my attitude, my passion, and channeling my efforts is only positive ways that will benefit and model for others in this community. I'm truly sorry that we need to be here tonight. I'm thankful for everyone who has shown me support. Come here tonight to help hold me up. I regret whatever has upset the council or the mayor and the misunderstanding as to my motivations Presumably, my words. I'm happy to explain myself in greater detail if there are specific questions as to how we got here. And otherwise, I ask you to please stand down, let me continue to stand for the river and the resources. I can't hear. Thank you for your comments. Just a, one, one comment I will make to make clear is uh, the resolution that's listed has nothing to do with policy. Um, and no one on this council has questioned Mr. Rice's expertise a single time. Is there anyone in the public with a comment on agenda items only? Allison, anyone online? Sure. Uh, after listening to this, and there are two people that you were removing from position. I think it is fair to let everybody know the reason why. You have simply shut people down at the end and thanked them for their input, but you have not given a reason. Ruth, is there anything else you'd like to share? Are you going to shut me down too without an answer? I'm not shutting you down. This, this is not a Q&A. It's public comment. Okay, fine. I think you owe it to everybody to know why the decision was made and who made it. Thank you. Thank you. Allison, anyone else? Public comment? Yes. I have Jeffrey Mann. Hey, Jeff. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I think just to uh, echo some of the other thoughts there, I just would like to know why and if it's not a matter of policy, on what basis is the decision being made? Thank you. Yeah, I agree with Ruth and the previous gentleman. Like, you know, I'd love to know what the the borough council and the mayor are doing to defend this decision and who do you have in mind that could possibly be 
uh, more qualified than Mr. Rice. I mean, I think we deserve it. So please uh, at least explain. Thank you for your comments. Again, this isn't about qualification and we're not uh, discussing other um, appointments versus this appointment. Allison, is there anyone else with a public comment? No one with their hand up. Oh, is anyone else in the public again with a public comment? Yes. Jack Rice, 45 minutes left. I, I, I have asked a direct question of council and mayor. In we rested in writing, I've asked it here, and I'm not given the respect of a response. And I take great, I don't even know the word that I'm looking for, but I, I, I feel that it is extremely disrespectful that we can't get some clarification or a conversation. I, out of respect for your husband, I would not like to share the reason in which he is not being appointed, that his appointment is being taken. Okay, but we've asked it's not... privately and you won't respond to us. So I have no other choice mm -hmm. but to come to a public forum. As a resident, I, I am asking you to let us in. It's it's in the resolution. It's it for be, it's it's That's for not. behavior unbecoming of a volunteer. But I want an explanation as to what that behavior is. <clears throat> I believe that there are several people in the room that don't have the full context of what took place. And if you did, you wouldn't be making that statement. Okay. There is a difference between what someone does, their subject matter expertise, their passion, their volunteerism, all of which. I, I we all commend Mr. Rice for. There's also a how you go about it. And as someone who's leading a commission and a committee who's supposed to be the person that everyone else follows suit, if the majority of the people in this room knew what actually took place, and I think you probably know Mrs. Rice. I do not. Then neither does my husband, which is why do you have that is not, not that's not accurate. Just talk to your husband about it today. That's not accurate. It's not so accurate. Talk oh, to I, my husband about it today. Yeah. So, thank you. Is there anyone else in the public with a public comment agenda item? One five one six six. Thank you. So, your guys are doing this action. Ooh. You, sir, what's your name and address, please? Uh, Ted Gassman. I uh, don't live in town. So you guys... Where do you live, sir? Uh, Lincroft. What's your address, please? I'm not going to disclose that. So my Allison, question... Is there anyone else with a public comment? No. All right. Uh, moving along to approval of minutes. April 8th, 2024, regular meeting. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Motion. Second. Allison, may I please have a roll call? Council Member Spoller? Yes. Tina Sally? Yes. Chloe? Yes. Scott? Yes. La Barbera? Yes. Olson? Yes. Uh, April 23rd, 2024, regular meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion. Allison, may I please have a roll call? Council Member Spoller? Yes. Tina Sally? Yes. Chloe? Yes. Scott? Yes. Olson? Yes. Thank you. Old business, uh, public hearing on the 2024. Did I miss something? Executive session. I missed one. I apologize. April 23rd, 2024, mm -hmm. executive session. So I have a motion to approve. Motion. Second. Allison, may I please have a roll call? Members, Stephen Sully? Yes. Sully? Yes. Hodge? Yes. Olson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, old business, public hearing on the 2024 municipal budget, ordinance number 2024-05. Amend Chapter 30, Land Use Section 3.3 D11, Notice of Public Hearing. Do I have a motion to open the hearing? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Does anyone have any comments or questions on this? Does anyone in the public have any comments or questions on Ordinance 2024 05? Allison, that? anyone? Okay, thank you. Oh, so, I'm sorry. Hold on. Probably button you drive. Is that the to AM. What's that? The or to AM. Is that all you can tell you? Yeah. So I'm sorry, which which or on which end? Uh, instead of the word or, the word is now and to provide both law and block and street. Oh, that's that one. Yeah, okay, that very good. Perfect. That wasn't the yeah. one. 
It, it's hard to know them by code. Are you doing something with regard to the restaurant ordinance as well that I haven't seen on the agenda? Did I miss that? No. 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 Cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, is there anyone else in the public with comment? Allison? No. Um, hey, real quick. Yeah. We said public hearing on the municipal budget and then linked it to ordinance number yeah. 2024 5. I think those are separate. Yeah. They are. Yes, they are. They are. All right. All right. So let's do let's do ordinance 2024 05 and then we'll go back to the municipal yeah. budget. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um I just I'll ask again then. Anyone in the public with a comment on the land use? Ordinance. It's right. This is making block and lot and address yes. both required yes. when it goes out for the got it. check. Mm -hmm. Allison, anyone online? Do I have a motion to close? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Do I have a motion to approve? Okay. Motion. Second. Second. <laughs> Allison, may I please have a roll call? Council members call. Yes. Yes. Ellie? Yes. Bowie? Yes. Fudge? Yes. Father Barra? Yes. Paulson? Yes. Uh, thank you. Now, public hearing on the 2024 municipal budget. I just, I, I'll start this, Mayor. I, I uh, Obviously, when we introduce the budget, we went into great detail. I'm not going to go into as much detail now. Uh, we do have uh, our current CFO, Colleen Lock, uh, joining us uh, via Zoom. And, of course, uh, Nancy <laughs> relocated, but she's over there. Um, I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. Uh, the borough uh, is utilizing a million five hundred ninety thousand dollars in surplus in this uh, budget. Uh, still leaves us with a very healthy surplus um, as we go forward. Um, we're also a very pleased report that uh, tax bill paid by the average assessed home will actually be going down by fourteen dollars and nine cents annually. Uh, this is just a slight reduction. It sends a strong message to the governing body, especially prudent. And it's far better than tax increase. Please keep in mind that the reduction in taxes paid includes the allowance for an increase in the average assessed home between 2023 and 2024. Um, as of this uh, draft, your tax rate is projected to decrease from 0 0.343 to 0 0.312, which is 9.04%. Uh, uh, this budget uh, also proudly appropriates $525,000 to capital which is our annual $215,000 for budget capital, $75,000 to buy a fully equipped police vehicle in 2024, and $35,000 for future bond or down payment, as well as $200,000 in art money that's offset uh, by an equal $200,000 in revenue making the budget transaction neutral. Um, it was a, a lot of work into this budget, and uh, I'm certainly open to the public for any questions or the government body members for the question. Yes, sir. Can you just um, explain again why the tax rate going down isn't enough to justify why taxes go down? Because um, years ago, uh, when uh, you used to be uh, have your house assessed once every 10 years, um, you could just follow the tax rate because your property value remained the same over time. Uh, Monmouth County participates uh, in uh, an annual uh, assessment of property taxes where everyone's values change annually based on market sales. So a home that averaged last year at a million uh, might average this year at a million two. So as as you were, uh, you, know, you think about taxes paid by your assessed value times the tax rate. As your assessed value goes up, you know even if your tax rate remains the same, um, it, it, your your taxes are still going to go up. So uh, we are very open in what the average home was assessed at in the prior year versus versus the current year. And we compare what that average house will pay in taxes, even with the increase in value. Perfect, thank you. Anyone else? Oh. Do I need a motion, Teresa? No, because it's on the actual yeah. agenda, right. sir. Okay. Um, and then, nobody else in the public now? No, nobody's got their hand up. Okay, okay. Uh, Moving along. Borough facilities update, Councilman La Barbera. So, going to rewind the tape. Um, last rewind year, the tape. Rewind the tape. I double clicked. I double clicked before. Um, <laughs> so, last year, um, we uh, established a, a phenomenal relationship with Fish Chapel to both enable um, a, a short term parking agreement and a long term parking agreement. Um, 
through the the conversations that we had um this chapel um and the borough entered into an agreement um to allow us allow the borough to leverage the this chapel parking lot while construction happens um and then ultimately when um construction's done the borough um would um uh, redo that parking lot and maintain it um and it went through a multitude of factors the partnership um, the, the parking arrangements for the community center, there was a whole slew of factors. We're happy to, to dive in if anybody wants to. Um, so what we are revisiting now that we are, I don't know how long, six months into it, eight months into it, we've wanted to um, finish the design of that long-term parking lot um, and then ultimately we'll look to um, take care of it next year. Um, and so the proposal in here, um, is from the Gold Sea Partnership. Majority of the work is from uh, Rick Lear uh, and Lear Associates, who's been um, supporting us um, in this. And so wanted to raise it here, see what initial questions there were, Mayor, um, answer any questions. Um, and similar to the, the Vic Hall Repair Plan, if there's consensus agreement, I'd like to put it on the next uh, agenda for approval. Um, this was not budgeted. We didn't budget this in our ordinance. Um, so the soft costs here, um, would have to come out of our capital, please correct me, um, and whatnot. Yes, sir. Um, it would come out as a pay-as-you-go capital, but the difference in pay-as-you-go capital is we don't break it to hard costs and soft costs because we're not going to issue debt for it. So bond council holds no standing. Uh, we can charge it directly without, so this cost would come right out of pay-as-you-go capital. Uh, without the validity that's a soft cost. Even though it is a soft cost, unlike a bond ordinance where they break it up in pay as you go, we can fund it directly. And we couldn't put this in the ordinance, right? We could not put this in a bond ordinance as part of facilities because we do not own the asset and bond council would, right. would frown upon. Uh, <laughs> yes. you know, they don't, they don't mind that and pay it directly, but we're certainly not going to issue debt for it. Right. We did pay for the easement right last year that, right. that, that, that did that, but that's why it couldn't be in that. And what what is the projected cost? It's been estimated around two hundred fifty thousand. And do we have it? We have enough money in Asia Capital to cover it. Asia Capital. Yes. Okay. You just have to be very careful when you get requests for that. That you be mindful that this. You you we can certainly cut a PO for this forty four thousand dollars when you approve it at the next meeting. But the fact that you're going to have to actually do the work and pay it, you have to monitor that pay as you go balance in the finance the committee. We we've, we've talked about it. You know, you just you're just adding two hundred fifteen thousand dollars with this year from this year's budget, and we have some left from prior years. But you can't get overly generous and say, "Oh yeah, we're going to say yes, yes, yes" to a lot of other things, and then find yourself short when it comes time to pay the bill to actually do the to do these things. So we're going to approve five and a quarter for this year. Pay go five and a quarter or five fifty. No, pay goes only two fifteen annually. Two hundred fifteen thousand okay. annually. Two fifteen, and what do we have uh, from? I'd have years? to look at the prior years, but we're, I think we're well over. Five or something, Brian, off the top of my head. So we'll have seven and change. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And this one less. And this thing change. We're going to go out. We go out to this. Remember, with the and the only reason I give this as a um, as a tangential example is remember with um, the DPW bid, we rejected the alternate, right? Because mm -hmm. it made it go higher. So this is another one of the reasons why with this separate by itself, it's it's at, Rich can explain it better than I can, right? But it's asphalt. It's curbing. There's Landscaping, there's stormwater management, there's electric, right, and all of that. So it's 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 better suited for um for it was asphalt. <laughs> I'll say. Hope it was pervious. Yes. Pervious. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. Moving along, new business introduction of ordinances 2024-06, amend chapter three, police regulations to add section 21 entitled. Resident protect, protection. Does anyone have anything on that? Questions? No? Anyone have a motion to approve? Motion. Second. Second. Allison, may I please have a roll call? Yes. 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 Paulson. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, on the consent agenda, just for your notes, 2024-127 is stricken. So we're talking about 2024-117 through 2024-132 um, without 127 in the middle there. Mm -hmm. um, and no temporary appropriation amendment, right? 
Right. If, no. it if, if it doesn't, yeah. So nothing, nothing to talk about there yet. Okay. Um, right. And uh, before we vote, is there anyone that wants to um, separate anything on the consent agenda? Yes, Mayor. Well, Please could you separate resolution 125 and 126? Sure. And it's done. Uh, is there anyone that wants to comment on? Any specific resolution before we well, move to the vote? Can I ask a question? Sure. So the 128 request to modernize OPRA, did they just vote on that though? Didn't this actually just pass? Or what? No, I think no. The, no, the vote is this week. I the mean. vote is this, this week. I think, I can't remember. Yeah, one of them has discussed it. I don't know if it's actually like a little bit. Okay. I think it may have gone to a vote today. So wouldn't this be a moot point or we're just supporting it regardless? Right, because that's the Senate bill. We supported the Senate today. Yeah. So I think it might have been voted on today. So does this matter? Like, does this need to be separate? Anyway? I didn't see it come through. Yeah, me neither. But I mean, I'm not saying it's important, but I didn't see um, legally by something. Yeah. So we're just supporting that's, that we want this, the new well, the, this, Yes. You're supporting the Your clerk. modernization yeah, of the OPA statute. With with all the specific details. So have we all read I every read single thing? But I understand it would facilitate. Now, does it, are you worried about it inhibiting access? Could a little bit, it? yeah. I mean, I just, I've read it. I don't know. Okay. I'm kind of on the fence. I, I think I, I would need to know more to vote on this specifically. Hmm. But can, Andrew, can you explain to me the no, it's 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 pretty complicated. Um over statute has been with us for a very long time. It, I I can summarize that it would, I believe, simplify the process. However, the transparency, if they modernize it, wouldn't it be as transparent. Would you it's that. being abused. Oprah is being abused by commercial vendors. Using... There's professional people out there that go and they just file Oprah requests in order to you know, yeah. enter into lawsuits, suing municipalities in order to recover certain funds. And so that's a problem for sure. But I guess I'm worried about a little bit concerned about the transparency for just regular residents who want to obtain information. What hindrance is put on them? Like, from what I understand, it could take longer. To get information, no. 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 My, what I didn't understand though is you said it, it it passed or it didn't pass. I just got yeah. a text that says New Jersey lawmakers pass overhaul of states open public records act. Yeah, so yeah, they passed it. They passed, yeah. they they passed, passed it. So what does that mean for us? So it's moved. That's what I. Oh, so we don't need to vote okay. because it would be in support <laughs> of. Thank you. It's a resolution. It's it's. I won't say it's an empty resolution, but it kind of is, right? This thing, unless you're going to use that resolution to send it to a state senator or an yeah. assembly person in order to show your support or yeah. that you're, you know, object to its introduction. So we don't need to agree to it for it to apply to us at all. Well, now it now it's now it's moved yeah. because it's Allison said it's passed. So well, so it does raise a question though. Do we have any? over related ordinances that are now out of date right because what we previously experienced when the state changes its guidance is our ordinances are out of date and i know from the zoning board and previous experience that that caused some confusion with what was the standard in the legislation that they needed to follow well similar to like the stormwater ordinance that yeah. we'll be discussing yeah. for the next you know you know couple months yeah it'll be a similar situation where we'll have to amend our ordinance to include it, whatever modernization that the Bill says I don't, don't have, have it's a state law. We don't have it. We follow a state law. There's no perfect. I just want to make sure there's I I, I go back to the uh um, yeah, thank you. May I be please go further? I did want to answer uh, Councilman Olson's question. Um as a member of the finance committee, he did ask where we are with page you know, capital. I pulled up my spreadsheet. Um as of uh April 19th, so this could be a little bit off, but probably not much. Uh we had 422,259. And that was before we adopted the budget, or will adopt the budget, which will bring us to six thirty-seven. Thank you. Um, to make things clear, why don't we go ahead and see if someone has a motion from one seventeen to one twenty-four, and then one twenty-nine to one thirty-two? Sure. I'll start with motion. that. I'll second it. Allison, may I please have a roll call? Councilmember Paul. Yes. Dean Sully. Yes. Bobby. 
Yes. Bunch. Yes. Bob Rivera. Yes. Also. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, for 2024-125, 2024-126, do you have any comments before I ask for a motion? 125 and 126. Well, why don't we address 125 first and then sure. Yeah. That'll determine whether we even discuss 125. Okay, fair enough. For 125, anyone have any comments? I do, Mayor. Um, uh, this is the this is the proposed resolution to revoke a volunteer from a position. Um, I I was sick at the last meeting, which is also why I didn't get to go to the executive committee. No, it's because I didn't get to participate. Um, and I know that there was a discussion at that time about this matter. Um, I just very clearly want to say that uh, while I understand we discussed personnel issues, not exact, I think it's so rare and unusual to have a reason to discuss a volunteer. Um, I see these as two different things. Volunteers are different. They're not personnel. Personnel has rights. Um, they're entitled to due process. The personnel that's listed on an executive resolution would be notes. We'd receive ironic advice notes, which is not funny, but anyway. Um, so I I wanted to raise this. I think it's important that we perhaps need to spend more time. Uh, I would suggest, and I don't know where everyone else is, but our fellow volunteers are not our employees. They're not personnel. Um, as such, I think it's important to put processes in place that may need to provide for removal. I mean, I'm not saying that that pathway doesn't need to exist. Um, I cannot support this particular pathway in the way that we're going about it. I think there's a very uncomfortable moment in here. And um, now I know there are uncomfortable moments in government and volunteerism, but I can't support this. And I wanted to explain why. Um, Council Moon Cole, boom, mm -hmm. please do not speak about anything regarding the executive session. Right. Okay. We did it. We did adopt those minutes. I understand, but okay. anything discussed in the you can't discuss anything in the executive session. Okay. Whether we adopt the minutes or not. Okay. So without saying anything about executive session, um, I can you if, if you want to discuss maybe what gets discussed in person in executive session, but not specific to anything. Okay. So having not attended, I, it, it would be impossible for me to discuss specifics. Um, it's my understanding that executive sessions are limited to uh, real estate, legal issues, and personnel, uh, which is reasonable given the business government has to conduct. And it's in the best interest of our residents to handle those matters in closed session to protect the interests of our residents. Um, that said, Volunteers fall into a different category. Um, and we may need to come up with a procedure that accommodates the kinds of actions that are contemplated tonight. Um, I've been to every council meeting, even through COVID, for five and a half years, and I've never seen a resolution to revoke a volunteer. I think it's bad form. I don't see a reason to come up with something new. Um, and yeah, we needed to. I needed to make that statement clear. We we, we rely on our volunteers. We're at least 150 volunteers strong, community based guide. That's how Bear Haven functions. Um, we are all volunteers. We're not personnel. That's okay. Sure. Um, so, if you can explain to me what the difference between the the rules which are like due process essentially so the difference between having a hearing for the environmental commission versus the Nevis St. River my understanding is that somehow I understand I think they're different because one's a committee one's oh, one's a commission once I guess a committee but so was he informed that well I'm trying to say, I don't know how to say this, but 
he doesn't get due process for the Navasink River. He doesn't necessarily get a hearing. Is that correct? Correct. Um, I don't know. How to... so, <laughs> so the, Maybe you need a profit. Environmental commission is established by one of the uh, ordinance mm -hmm. through our town, and it's by advice. Mayor appoints and with the consent of the council. Okay. Um, and he resigned from the environmental commission, correct? Yes. yes. So with regards to Navasing River, he is essentially a liaison. Mm -hmm. He's appointed. There is no need um, to have the consent of the council in order to name him onto the Navasing River municipalities. So I mean, essentially, there was no need for us to do a consent to take him off then. If there's no consent to put them on, is that correct? correct? That, that's like the short. So I guess I'm kind of wondering why it's in front of us then. If if he was appointed by resolution, that really was he wasn't approved by the body Okay, so, so then, so then, so then, so then, why doesn't he get a hearing for that position versus the environmental commission? The environmental, my understanding, the environmental commission is set by way of our ordinance, right? And that's mm -hmm. contained in our ordinance. Mm -hmm. Navasink River Municipality Committee mm -hmm. is not. So I'll let, I'll tell you where I'm standing then. I don't feel comfortable pushing this through based on him not getting sort of the fair hearing, which was my understanding when they were lumped together. So you also understand there is a volunteer handbook the municipal, municipal Access Liability Joint Insurance Fund Volunteer Handbook that was adopted uh, in 2021, December of 2021. It lays out with the, the disclaimer and the nine plus pages uh, regarding uh, conduct of volunteers, ethical conduct, political activity, workplace, um, different protections, as well as, you know, since it's established by the GIF, which is the Joint mm -hmm. Insurance Fund, this is what is, I believe, signed by every member, every volunteer member mm -hmm. in Fairhaven. Uh, reviews this handbook, receipt for volunteer handbook manual, date, signature, print name, position appointment commit. Um, so that language is taken out of there. As far as personnel, and I was just provided this about three or four hours ago. Um, and I wish wanted to read a section with regards to personnel. Uh, please be aware that this handbook contains a summary of several laws, rules, regulations, and policies that are applicable to volunteers. However, this handbook is not intended to be a comprehensive description of every policy that applies to volunteers. The Borough Fairhaven's Personnel Policies and Procedures Manual, a more comprehensive comprehensive document that is applicable to volunteers is also available for review. Has anyone seen that? Okay. It's, it's probably yeah, about- Every volunteer signed yeah, they, they signed this. He's talking about the policy and procedure amendments. It's about 300 pages. That's just, I guess, it's like- yeah. oh, it's, not it's not that, it's not that. It's not that. Not that. Yes, it is. I saw it today. How many pages is it? I'll just and ask now. Uh, I, I'm going to say 100 on top of my head. I have it sitting on my desk at, at least, you know. It's, it's not exactly- something a volunteer sits down and casually so they're entitled to look at it and a lot of the pages in a trade zero form yeah not policy you know here's the big difference it's it's not that they should i my my i've been working with communities for years um and volunteers we happen to be rich with volunteers it's not the typical case um i think we need to be very thoughtful about how we care for and nurture that resource we're lucky and i and i think we should extend as much courtesy kindness and encouragement as possible i think kindness is a very good word to use mm -hmm. as we move along i think that's very appropriate does anyone else have any other comments on this no I'm good does anyone want to call for a motion to approve so Second. Sorry. Allison, may I please have a roll call? This is for 2024 125. Allison, Paul? No. Maselli? No. Howie? Yes. Scott? Um, may I want to say something before I vote? Is that, yeah. is that okay? Sure. Um, 
I have found this to be one of the most difficult votes that I've had to make sitting on the side of the dais. And I am looking at it from two perspectives, the perspective of the municipality that we had took an oath uh, to represent to the best of our abilities. And I'm looking at it from the volunteer side, the volunteer position. Our volunteers who are appointed by the borough are there to represent our best interests and to conduct themselves in a professional manner at all times. To that end, we also know the passion that our volunteers bring to what they do and their interests and their expertise makes Fairhaven a much, much better place to live. And from the discussion tonight and seeing um, uh, community members, not just from Fairhaven, but from other communities supporting Mr. Rice, no one has ever questioned his loyalty or his passion for the river but some, including Mr. Rice himself, has questioned the motives and the way he has gone about protecting the river. So I'm also aware that what we do is going to affect maybe volunteers in the future who might feel that their efforts are not appreciated or they could be let go at any time. So all of that has kind of made this a very difficult vote for me because I I I I would like to vote for both. I'd like to vote for okay. Mr. Rice and I'd like to vote for the municipality. Mm -hmm. So to that end, I'm going to abstain. Yes. Also. Yes. Uh thank you. Uh moving along 2024 one great yeah, so oh, yes. Um, 2024-126. Appoint Navasink River Municipalities Committee member Shona Sullivan. Anyone want to discuss this before we vote? I, I don't know anything about this pretty yeah. I don't know. Can you tell us about it? I'd love to learn more about it. Okay. Um, you know, Sean is a member of our community. He lives on Fairhaven Road. He was recommended by people um, that I find to be uh, a good representation of character and skill. Um, he has a deep affection for the river and the community. And um, for me, when it comes to Sean, he's got a, a seven month audition here to see if he's the right man moving forward in that position. So the term expires at the end of the year? That's correct. Yes. Yes. It's an it's a it's a place of filling the expired term expiring term of Mr. Rice. Does he have any experience specific with the river that you just out of curiosity? As far as the type of experience, what type of experience are we talking about? I mean, does he have a job? I don't. I don't believe. I don't believe he has a job Does in he, marine. Is he a boater? And I don't know, I, yes. Something. Yes, he is. Okay. I think he's a fisherman too. Yes. And does he? Um, and he has some understanding of the DEP's role and the role of the committee. Um, I don't want to misrepresent what he has and what he does not have. So that would be a question for Mr. O'Sullivan himself. Again, this has been on the agenda since Thursday. So those questions could have been asked beforehand. I can't answer for it. I don't think they were relevant in showing you how that other vote was going to go. But disagree, but that's okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. That's all the questions. Can I, I um Andy, can I ask your question? Yes. Am I if I voted no though, can I vote for the I mean sure, sure. Sure. separate work? I'll make a motion to approve. Uh, House member have a roll call. House member Cole? Yes. Stephen Tilly? Yes. Cody? Yes. Touch? Abstain. Albert Rivera? Yes. Olson? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving along, department reports, April 2024. Do I have a motion to accept the reports as submitted with a thank you? Motion with a thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you. Uh, next up in the meeting is the good of the borough portion of the meeting. Please stand and identify yourself by clearly stating your name and address for the record. Please try to observe a time limit of three minutes. 
Is there anyone in the public? Go to the borough. Yeah, it's funny. Um, okay, I feel awful when you watch this whole thing, which is happening. And Becky, thank you for just being so thoughtful about the whole, all the considerations. I mean, I guess I, we have the environmental commission, which you can do whatever you want. And it's just our town, but watching all these other towns impacted by this decision we made, that Brian, is Brian and did something insulting or something. Um, I, it just as incredibly dedicated volunteer and having spoken to other volunteers in town, it is um, unnerving mm -hmm. that if so, if I speak my mind or I say something that you don't like, I can be revoked. I mean, I just, I, it's, I, don't want, I don't want to cut you off. I just want to make sure that. I'm going to say it again. This has nothing to do with policy. Zero. So continue. You can no, speak your mind. You can speak as long me. as you're respectful. You can speak your mind all you want. Well, I'm I'm right. saying it's just me. If I say something wrong, I can just be fired. Right? Is that, I mean, do you no. know, I don't know. No. Well, it does say you can be let go with you without, without cause. With you. Yeah, I, I'm letting you know cause. you wouldn't be for the environmental commission. For the environmental commission. Okay, so th there's a distinction between the commission and another appointment. This is all getting a little muddy in my mind. I still think we need to clean it up. But just for clarity, this there in the handbook, it says you can be removed. With yeah. or without cost. Well, let, let, let me just be some, uh, clear though about the environmental commission, and we spoke about it at the last meeting. Is that the environmental commission uh, ordinance? It, it's silent as to removal. So we there then look to the state statute, which controls. The state statute provides for ways to remove a committee member, commission member. And that's what we did. Uh, let me let me let me withdraw withdraw that. There was a resignation, and that's why it was not needed for the environmental commission. He resigned because he resigned. No, he worked. No, he just resigned. So there's no okay. there was no resolution for okay. a revocation. I guess I I don't know. I just I he he is a tough. And I mean, there's a lot going on with him, but he does have an expertise. It was demonstrated tonight how a lot of people respect his knowledge. Um, he was a valuable member. I, I just, I don't know. No, no one, I'll repeat what I said before. No one up here has questioned Mr. Rice's expertise, passion, or knowledge. Mm -hmm. Not a single person up here. And it is a loss. To acknowledge what you're saying. Yeah, what is saying is it's a loss. It just struck me listening to the other things. Okay, I remember. Okay, I just, yeah, as a volunteer, it just like, felt a little late. Mm -hmm. so, anyway. I'd say something. So, it's sort of in response to that, the I understand that that we the optics are bad, right? We're we're not we're not saying things. We're not explaining maybe to your satisfaction. Um, and it makes us, it makes me look bad, let's say, let's speak for that. The only way I could make myself look good and justify it is to hear it. And I, that would, that would, um, I think, um, it would be to my benefit and to Mr. Rice's expense, and I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'll just, I'll just absorb the arrows. Mm -hmm. And if he, you know, if people are angry, I understand, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, Air dirty laundry in public. I will say, though, if, if Mr. Sobel, I'll look to you. Um, it would be great if we could get some counsel along these lines so that this body doesn't find itself in this position again and that our volunteers don't have to withstand something like that. We spoke again about, you know, many of the ordinances. We did. Absolutely. Um, because there are times when decisions will need to be made, but we need a procedure that preserves everyone's dignity. Um, and that's within reach. I'm sure we can figure that out. Absolutely. Is there anyone else in the public with a um, go to the borough comment? I, I do. Moments that Phil's coming in. 
very short and sweet. So for instance, I first started here. I just want to thank you guys for altering your um, procedure on how you uh, announce your change orders. That there's now an explanation for some level, just at least a level of some explanation of what should go for. So step forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Go to the borough. I have what I'm saying. Sure. As I'm saying. No, I just want to, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, it just, you know, I think it's important to keep note of this. Um, I think that the borough council owes the public more of an explanation, given the qualifications of Mr. Rice and the importance of the role. Um, I get it. There's something behind the scenes that you're not willing to talk about, but uh, it just seems arbitrary and capricious, you know, uh, the decision. And it's it's unsettling as someone who's volunteered for the town and will look to continue to volunteer for the town in the future, um, as you all are as volunteers. Um, it's just, uh, it's unsettling that it seems like there's there's this, this power to make a decision uh, that people clearly disagree with, yet it's completely disregarded. So just, it's upsetting, that's all. Thank you for your time, Chris. Anyone else? Allison, go to the bar. Great plan, sir. Hi, I have a question sure. for, for the whole council. Do you folks ever get correspondence from the residents? The reason I yes. asked this, the reason I asked this is because years ago, before you, before you probably even lived in town, Part of the council meeting was reading communications from the residents, and it gave a better idea of what the thinking was of the residents. And if you get two or three residents that write on the same subject, maybe there's something you should be looking into. And I think it, it, the letters should be made public, even if they're synopsized, just to get a tenor of the concerns of the residents that moved them enough to write to you. I think there should be a communications segment of the agenda saying, well, we got we got three letters on deer and we've got uh, seven letters on the speed limit and, and eight letters on parking or lack thereof. Just to give you a, a better idea on a day-to-day -day basis of how the residents feel about what's going on in town. Okay. Not, not a bad idea. I, yes, we get correspondence from residents pretty often. Um, I think a lot of that probably has been replaced by people just going on Facebook and, and posting their thoughts on their own. And then obviously we have this segment, Go to the Borough, and Agenda Items Only, where people get to voice their opinions. Um, but, I mean, I get letters and emails all the time, Ruth, and uh, those are shared with the appropriate committee liaisons. Um, you know, with administration, with uh, police chief, with DPW, depending on what the feedback is. So thank you for your time. Allison, Wait, is else? I'm not finished. I'm not finished. Okay. My second thing is I'd like to give you folks a homework assignment. I'd like you to, in your spare time, if you have any, go through the property maintenance ordinances. I think it's section 14 and section 16 and eliminate every ordinance that is not a direct health and safety, safety issue because many of the things that are in there are based on aesthetics and one man's meat is another man's poison. You have, if a person is paying their taxes, they have a right to keep their property any way they want and not be led legislated by the town and I those now. property or those property or property maintenance ordinances need to be winnowed down to things that are actual actual issues that are causing some sort of a public health or safety issue and the rest should be simply personal choice 
-hmm. And if you read them, you'll see that a lot of these are being, they're the resolutions and ordinances are punitive and they're being used for codification to punish the residents. They need to be winnowed. Thank you. There's a third category that legally justify things like your property maintenance code. There is public health, public safety, and public welfare, which has to do with the collective benefit. And oftentimes they can drift into what you're calling this aesthetic area, but it, it really isn't about aesthetics. It's about shared sensibilities, shared values, and fair enough keep of properties that are mutually beneficial to everyone. But, but that's that's somebody else's at. that's somebody else's decision. I mean, it's, it's government's decision. It's the jurisdiction of this body. I don't know that it's been changed in a long time. But... What happened to private property rights? <laughs> that's a whole nother discussion. We they're really strong. Uh, we appreciate we appreciate the call. It's always nice to hear from you, uh, Allison. Anyone else? I have such a pride. Good evening. I'm a little here? confused. Uh, I'm better finally. I, I I was sick the same night that um, Councilwoman Cole was, and mine lasted a long time. Anyway, what she said about not attending the executive session on uh, April 23rd um, made me look at the resolution that sent you into executive session. So that's why I'm confused because the only personnel that was being talked about was chief financial officer or borough administrator position. So there's we nothing about talking. We, we announced that it was amended. To include volunteers. To include volunteers. Which is not an executive session matter. I don't know if that's really stated anywhere. I've never seen it. Yes, I'm not saying that it's not something that we have heard. Ask Keller. That's what he I, 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 I think the Jeff would just the work personnel is, 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 the work personnel is listed in the um, volunteer handbook numerous times. Thank you, Susan, for your call. Do you have anything else, Susan? No, that was it. Okay, thank you. Allison, anyone else? Yes, sir. I have one thing. <laughs> Can we actually get a credit to be positive? Um, I guess I'm allowed to speak, right? I'm a mm -hmm. resident. Um, Name it. I've been dating yourself 45 bills on the third. Um, on May 23rd, next Thursday night, so two Thursdays, we are having a fundraiser uh, for the 12 U um, Boys Diamonds team to go to Cooperstown. It hasn't been done in some years, and we're look, looking to get back on track. It's a fundraiser to offset the enormous cost in order to go to Cooperstown, which is where our, the Baseball Hall of Fame is. Uh, we are actually going. The reason I'm saying this is because my son is playing on the team, as well as Councilwoman Bowie's uh, son. And uh, so if anyone wants to come out for a good night, uh, we have Officer Mike Campanella, uh, the Knollwood School. Uh, he is a stand-up comic, I guess. So he will be performing. Oh. He's amazing. So I guess he's good. Uh, he'll be performing as well. So what's the location? At the, oh, I'm sorry, at the Columbus Club. On May 23rd from 7 to 10 p.m. Where it all happens. So, so, something, so something positive. I have something positive, too. Okay, good. Uh, Lovery Live Day got postponed from the 19th. So now it's going to be this weekend on Sunday from 1 to 4 at uh, Third Street Trail. A lot of people from the committees from towns will be there. We will also have a lot of um, nonprofits and other uh, resources. So everyone come out. Anything else I should say, Barney? Um, and I want to get a feel for, we'll talk after which council members are coming, but um, we will be, some of the council members will be reading books with the library. They'll be out there with the earth-friendly books. and make the book. So yeah, everyone come out. Happy day. Great. <laughs> Council President Cut. So I have I have I think what is the best news to talk about is Fairhaven Day, which is on June 8th, and it's fast approaching. And now is the time when we start looking for volunteers. 
We need a lot of volunteers. We need volunteers to help set up. We need volunteers to sell tickets. We need volunteers to distribute t-shirts. We need volunteers to clean up. We need volunteers for everything. And if you go to www.fairhavenday.com, uh, there is a special place where you can sign up. It's listed in uh, different time categories. Uh, you can see exactly the spot that you might wish to volunteer to work on for a couple of hours. And we would appreciate everybody uh, giving us a couple mm -hmm. of hours and helping with our um, volunteers. I added it to the agenda for our meeting on Wednesday, too. Oh, good. I, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just kidding. <laughs> Carolyn. Uh, I just wanted to uh, second what Luke said about reading communications at the meeting. Um, as somebody who has sought help from the council, it often seems unclear how to do that properly. Um, and like, can you talk to everyone at once or what's the right mechanism for doing that? Um, so I have used an email, but then hearing something back is lacking. <laughs> so there's not really a conversation. So it's hard to figure out how to do that right. And honestly, I think if I'm sorry, I missed no, that. Okay. Yeah, what if, so I want to second what Bruce said. And I said as somebody who has sought help from the council, it is often unclear how to do that effectively. Like, how can you know you I would send an email to the council, but then I might get three sentences back on one of the points. So it's not effective conversation. Sure. Um and it is sometimes unclear. And then what does happen, and people will even advise you for this, that we're all, we all understand the most effective way to get attention is to go on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So give us an alternative that works better. People won't do that. You know? Well, I'm not necessarily saying not to go on Facebook. No, no, but, I agree. Right. But, um, but uh, what I would probably recommend is just, you know, when we do settle on a new when we're getting closer to the new borough minister, maybe the communications committee sits mm -hmm. down and yeah. they develop a new plan. That would be I great. think that's probably the best way to do it. That'd be great. And yeah. I mean, I you know, there's certainly a good use for Facebook, but there's also bad uses of it, and maybe we can have a better path that will discourage some of the bad uses of it. Just yeah. wanted to be clear. I'm not sure that's possible, but right. <laughs> we can't have a path that discusses borough business outside right. of the meeting. Right. I think that's the thing up. about an email makes you think you could open a dialogue, but in fact, you can't, right? Because you're, oh, yeah, you, you can't have a dialogue at the council on an email right. or even a, a subset of the council. I mean, gets tricky. The, the best uh, forum is, is yeah. these meetings, really. Yeah, but then also, like, you know, often don't get answers back, they just mm -hmm. kind of state your concern and go away. Sure. So, mm -hmm. um, some sort of productive mechanism would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Anyone else? No? Allison? No? All right. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to move toward. Oh. No, 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 Jared. We're out. Oh. Oh, I did have something. No, you no. didn't. I did. I did. I remembered it. Okay. I was on the record as being against the gray camp, and I have taken a lot of heat. On the gray can, making sure everyone knows that. But driving around the borough for the first time, I feel like in forever, I'm not weaving in and out of leaf and brush. I'm not playing Frogger to get from one side of the borough to the other. So I want to applaud actually the, the leaf and brush committee because I think it actually is going to be a so, so I was wrong. And okay. Mayor, I'll end on a positive note. Mm -hmm. I will not be at Love Where You Live Day on uh, Sunday the 19th because it's my 45th wedding anniversary. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the good news is everywhere now. Anyone else who's good news? You get all. <laughs> no, no, no. Bill, come on. <laughs> he gave you gave that's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um we're gonna to move towards adjournment. Uh it is 9 49 p.m. to have a motion. Motion. Second. Uh all in favor. Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Or moving to executive session. No, no, no. Oh, no. Very there's cool. no executive session. No. We're moving to adjournment. Not right. We're done. Oh, We're out. Michael, I'm texting you about oh, that. <laughs> 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 <laughs>